iClone 7. And I'm going to go directly into iClone here to just show you the scene that we're going to be reproducing. Okay, um, so let's go ahead and uh, play back. Uh, <clears throat> uh, get me out of here. We know you have the money, Lebowski, and you're going to tell us one way or the other. I already told you, I don't know where the money is. Just let me go. Okay, so very, very simple, very kind of silly and, and easy scene. Um, only about, so only a um, thousand two hundred frames. So basically in this, in the span of the next hour, we're going to recreate this entire scene from scratch. Okay, you can see we have some uh, interesting camera movement. If we uh, scrub back here, um, we're gonna just basically be using two simple cameras and uh, some simple camera movement as well as uh, depth of field and lighting to create a cool dramatic scene like this. Okay, so um, without further ado, let's go ahead and start from scratch. I'm gonna go ahead and load a new project here. And again, if I move a little bit too quick for you guys, um, just uh, feel free to put any questions you have in the Q&A panel and you can always uh, ask those and I'll get to those a bit later. Okay, if you end up with a scene like this where there's nothing on your screen, you can press Control G to toggle your grid on and off. I often use this hotkey, that's Control G, okay, to toggle your grid on and off. It's very useful when you're uh, creating your scene initially, when you're basically creating the layout for your, for your structure. Okay, and in, th in this scene, we're only gonna be creating a single room, okay? Um, so basically where you can find all your stuff for, to create a simple room uh, is going to your content tab here. And if you go to your uh, props tab up here, under props, um, your prop folder here, you will have a folder called 3D Blocks. This comes standard uh, default with iClone 7, okay? I'm just gonna move this over a little bit so you can see it a little bit better. And in 3D Blocks, we'll have a subfolder called Wall and Floor, okay? And Wall and Floor basically contains everything that you'll, you'll want to you know, have to create a basic room, a very square basic room, okay? So what I'm gonna do is just, I'm just gonna double click on this Wall 001, okay? We're gonna use this. You can see it just uh, loaded in our scene here. So we have a wall, pretty cool. We're, we're well on our way, okay? Um, there's door and floor and all that stuff as well. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but let's just go ahead and construct the walls for our scene. Now walls are pretty simple. Um, what I'm going to do is we're going to apply material to this wall first, and I'm gonna talk about why in just a moment here. Um, so what I'm gonna do is we have this wall and we wanna have a brick wall um, surrounding our character in his scene, getting, uh, getting in his chair, getting interrogated there. We have a corrupt cop that's interrogating him. <clears throat> we'll bring him in later. Okay, so uh, if you have uh, substance materials, there's a really good pack that I recommend purchasing called the Substance PBR 200 pack, okay? Um, this contains a whole bunch of uh, substance materials. And again, this is found up in the media tab in your content manager under material and Substance PBR 200, okay? Uh, you have to purchase this separately from the content store. Just keep that in mind. Um, we have some default subs substance materials that are uh, embedded with uh, iClone 7, but these PBR 200 ones, as you can see, there's a lot more selection. There's bricks, um, there's fabric and leather, there's different types of ground, there's uh, organic stuff like um, there's all different types of plastic. Okay, I don't wanna go through all these. You can explore that on your own time. I'm just gonna apply a simple brick uh, texture to our uh, substance material, rather to our wall. Okay, so you can go through the bricks here and blah, blah, blah. Let's just click and drag this one here. I think this one looks kind of cool because it has the occasional discolored brick. <clears throat> okay, now a good thing to do at this point is to kind of bring in, a, I'll move this down a little bit, is to uh, bring in a character um, because you want to kind of see the scale of your scene. So what I can do is just take my, I go up to my avatar uh, uh, tab or actor tab up here rather and go into my avatar folder. And I'm just gonna bring in this uh, Outfits Kevin, okay? I'm just gonna click and uh, drag him in, maybe somewhere over here, it doesn't really matter. Okay, so we wanna kind of make the, the room relative, size relative to, their, to our character because it's just gonna be, you know, we don't have a giant in a castle or anything like that. Okay, so I, I think the, the height uh, of the wall is just fine, okay? But obviously those bricks look really massive and that's a big problem because we wanna kind of make those bricks look a little bit better um, a little bit more detailed. And uh, so what we can do is we're gonna go over to, uh, with our uh, wall selected here, we're gonna go over to materials. Get my zoom panel out of the way there. And I'm gonna go up to here to mat the material tab. And you can see if you apply a substance to your wall, 
you're going to have this little red uh, kind of icon in the in the in the um, little square here. Okay, that that indicates that this is a substance material, and you can modify the values in real time. So as your timeline progresses, you can change the the pattern of this wall to kind of look older. And I'll show you what I mean in just a moment because we go down here to our substance section, and you can see. We have a bunch of uh, options here. I'm not going to go into too much detail here because we have a lot of stuff to cover. I'm just going to change my output size here to uh, 2048. And you can see it gets a lot more detailed there. Uh, if we change it to like 1024, um, slightly more detailed, um, you know, 64 by 64, you can see it's like a Super Nintendo type of, uh, you know, 8-bit uh, graphics. Uh, I'm going to stick with 1024 by 1024, okay? Just because this is a, a lower value. And when you have higher output size, it requires more processing speed for your graphics card to, uh, to make these adjustments. Okay, and if you have questions about that, you can ask me later, okay? Now, you can adjust the number of bricks here in your substance graph, okay? If you want, you can have more bricks on the x-axis, you can have more bricks on the y-axis, just like this, okay? Um, however you want. Uh, don't do too many, but uh, you can see uh, what, whatever you want to do here. Now, um, what I'm going to do is we're just going to kind of keep it maybe at the original value, I forget what the original value was, something like this, maybe five and 15, okay? And there's brick spacing you can adjust as well. You can move, uh, adjust the spacing between the bricks just like this, okay? Um, how you can have various uh, parameters like that. There's all sorts of different values uh, you can choose, like uh, depth variation, okay? You can't really see it from here, but if you go to the side, you can see there's slightly uh, difference in, the, in variation for the depth. Um, you can also adjust like brick roughness, make them smoother looking or make them uh, rougher looking like this. All sorts of values here that you can modify in your own time. Now, I'm not gonna worry too much about this, you know, because th this is all kind of stuff you can just explore on your own time, okay? You can see if we increase this brick height, uh, because we have a, uh, uh, um, the displacement map up there, we're able to um, adjust the height of all this stuff and. Uh, yeah, and I'm not, not going to go into too much detail on this, but there's all sorts of channels and uh, we don't need to worry about channels, um, parameters you can adjust as well. Um, okay, but say we've adjusted all these and we, we, we like what we have. I don't quite like what I have right now, but I'm going to show you another way to adjust these uh, substance materials. Um, and the way that we're going to do uh, that is we're going to close down our substance right here. And if you don't have a substance, this is the way you can actually make your materials look a lot better. Okay, so that's the substance way. Again, if you don't have the money for the substance pack, you can just apply a material and you can do it this way as well, okay? So at the top, we also have a section called UV settings here, okay? Again, this is all in the material tab. <clears throat> and we have a, a tiling setting here in our UV settings, right? So this is UV settings. We wanna make sure we select affect all channels, okay? And we can, we can tile our UV tiling to like maybe two, okay? Uh, on the U and two on the V, okay? It looks a little bit better, maybe even three. We can put a value of like three on the V and three on the U, okay? Maybe that's too many bricks. You know, we can do 2.5 as well, okay? 2.5 and there you go, okay? So, uh, you know, once we're happy adjusting all those parameters, I don't wanna spend too much time on the single piece of wall again. Um, then what I wanna do is I'm going to bake this texture. And the reason I'm going to bake it is because when you have a, subs when you have a lot of substance textures, uh, substance materials in your scene, it's going to really lag on your processing speed, okay? So if I have like a dozen of these walls and I have them all, you know, set to the substance material, um, it's going to really, you know, lag things down um, because the computer is basically analyzing all of those substance materials because it can, you can change the values of those substance materials as the timeline goes on. It gets a little bit more complex, but again, you can ask me later if you have more questions. But I'm just gonna go ahead and select all these textures and just go ahead and bake, okay? Bake. Down here, bake substance. Okay, now if you wanna go back to what you had before, you can always select here, use substance graph, and that will return it back to your substance values, okay? But just to save resources, I'm going to use these texture settings and they're all baked. Okay, so that's the material. That basically covers the materials part. And I'm gonna re be repeating this a little bit later on. But uh, for now, let's go ahead and continue on. We're gonna construct our room. 
So one thing I'm, I recommend having um, in place when you're constructing a room, let's go up to edit here and go to preferences. Um, there's an option under your control called snap to model. <coughs> okay. And you can, you can use the control M hotkey here to snap to model. And basically what this does is this will snap your models basically airtight to each other. Okay. So if I'm going to construct a, a room made of multiple walls, I generally want to have that enabled so I can snap each model to each other. And what I mean is this, let's press the W hotkey. Okay. The W hotkey corresponds with this movement gizmo up here. Okay. And you can see our movement gizmo appears. What I'm going to do is I'm going to press control. I'm going to hold control and I'm going to click and drag on the red arrow. And you can see what happens is that creates another wall. And as I move it over here, it just kind of snaps into place just like that. Okay. Just like that. Okay. So now we have two sections of walls and that's how easy it is to just, you know, multiply your values. Now to make this even better, what we're going to do, um, we're going to go to our scene manager here. You can see we have wall one, which is the original wall and wall zero in parentheses. Okay. Now what I want to do to make this easier is I'm going to attach wall one with the zero in parentheses to the regular, to the original wall. So with the second wall selected, I'm going to go up to my modify tab or attribute tab rather, and go down here to attach and go to pick parent and select the original wall. Okay. And now you can see in the C manager, the wall zero is a sub prop of the wall zero zero one. Okay. Now if I select wall zero zero one, now we have an option under attach to merge sub prop. Okay. And we can just go ahead and do that. Let's go ahead and merge sub prop. And now it's just a single wall. So now we have one single wall and we can just repeat the process. We can press the W hotkey. And um, if we want, we can also change the pivot point. Okay. The uh, origin point of this wall. So you can see right now it's at the original point midway between the first wall. If we go down here to pivot, we can go to quick set and go to something like back and press it down here. Uh, quick set back and then down here. And it'll change our pivot point to the middle. Okay. Um, there's reasons you'll want to do that, um, but I'll tell you a little bit more uh, as we move along. Okay. So let's go ahead and do the same thing. I'm going to hold control and click and drag. I'm just going to click and it's going to create another uh, wall just like this. Okay. So now we have two walls. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold control and click and drag one more time. And we're going to make a third wall like this. Okay. But actually, what I'm going to do, I'm going to delete that because we don't want to create that wall just now. I'm going to create that from scratch. Okay. So let's go to the content manager and find our prop again. Uh, same wall. We'll just click and drag it in. Okay. And this wall, we're going to rotate 90 degrees. So I can press the E hotkey to rotate it like this. Okay. And there's our rotation gizmo. Make sure it's at 90 degrees exactly here um, under your attributes. Okay. And then we'll just go ahead and uh, click and drag. Just like this and it'll snap into place just like that. You can see it snaps. Okay. That makes things a lot easier. Cool. Okay. So we have this uh, place right here all set up. Let's go ahead then. And uh, what I'm going to do now is select my regular wall here. We're going to go to materials and we're going to go up here and we're going to paint material. Okay. So when I select paint material and I select this wall over here, it's going to paint that material onto the third wall. Okay. Regardless of the size, regardless of uh, where it is, it's going to, you're going to paint and it's going to copy that onto this wall right here. Okay. And we'll just press escape to get out of that. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and click and drag control, click and drag this wall over here. Shazam. Okay. So now we have this guy all boxed in, which is, you know, a little claustrophobic, but that's fine. What I'm going to do uh, just, just for, uh, um, Clarity's sake here is I'm going to take this wall and I'm going to make it invisible just for ease of, of uh, viewing here. Okay, so we'll go to our scene manager here and this wall, I'm going to make it invisible. Okay, um, we don't really need to worry about the wall names right now. Uh, we can take care of that later if we want. What I'm going to do here now is I'm going to click and drag another wall in. This one has a doorway. Okay, so I'm going to click and drag. Actually, just click and drag this one with the doorway and the window in it. Okay. And then we're just going to rotate this one 90 degrees as well. And it doesn't really matter because you can always go over here and select 90 degrees. And that wall is essentially going to be the same size as the wall behind it. 
So let's just place this one, click and drag a little bit over here. And if we want, we can just kind of stretch it by pressing the R hotkey. Uh, let's move it over here first. Now, when you stretch something, when you stretch a prop, you have to be careful um, because if I, if I stretch it from here, like this, it's going to stretch on both sides, okay? Because the pivot point is in the middle, okay? You can stretch it like this and this, and that's not something we want to do. Um, generally, what you'll want to do is you'll want to have your pivot point on one side, okay? And I'm going to go move the pivot point to this side here and press the R hotkey, and you can stretch it this way, okay? So scaling can be done with the R hotkey. If I'm not sure if I mentioned that, and E hotkey for uh, um, rotation, okay? So W, E, and R are the hotkeys you need to know. So let's just stretch this one out, make sure it's the same size as the other one behind it, and there we go. Okay, now this material is, you know, fine, but what I want to do is go to our media here. Let's give this one a little bit of a different uh, material. Let's give this one, uh, oh, I don't know, uh, maybe a concrete and clay. We can make it sort of, uh, or a uh, Let's go maybe to a stone one here. You know, whatever kind of whatever kind of material would be in the basement of some kind of creepy uh, factory or something like that. Uh, maybe there's a concrete and clay one that I'll do here. Um, yeah, let's just try something like this grainy brown concrete right here. There you go. Okay. And then again, you'll want to make sure that because uh, the material right now doesn't look super good. You can see it's fairly low resolution. You want to make sure you go down and. Uh, change that uh, substance value, output size to at least 1024. You can see it improves there. You can even take that one up to 2048. And not much of a difference, okay? So when doubt, you know, take the one down here, 1024, and then we can just go ahead and uh, bake it. Again, same process under texture settings. Just uh, bake everything. So bake displacement, take this one, take this one and so on and so forth, you get the point, okay? So uh, I think we're good to go. We'll just kind of use this as our, as our main scene. Okay, now I'm gonna deal with the lighting a lot later. Um, and well, I need to bring the floor, obviously, I guess. Let's do that really quick, okay? So the floor, same process, under wall and floor. Let's just bring in this floor zero one, okay? And uh, that'll do, that'll do just fine. Um, what I'm gonna do in this case is we're going to scale the floor a little bit uh, more narrow. Okay, so let's do that by changing the pivot point of the floor again. Um, where are we here? Oh, we're in materials. Attributes. There we go. And R, scale it down to here. Okay, and don't worry about this stuff poking out on the outside. That's not going to be in camera view, so we're not going to worry about that right now. We're just going to apply another material really quick to our, uh, to our floor here. Let's just apply this like cracked concrete maybe. Okay, or maybe something a bit more uh, eroded like this one here. All right, I like this one, uh, but it looks kind of low resolution. So again, same process, materials. Let's go to uh, change the uh, output size to 2048. There we go, something like that. And we can uh, change our hold density, you know, um, something like this. And you can adjust the, the various values uh, as you see fit there. Okay, but then again, at the end, just make sure you bake everything, okay? Otherwise, it's gonna be, uh, it's gonna lag your machine. It really lags my machine. Even with a couple of walls like this, it'll really lag things down. <clears throat> okay, good to go. So let's go ahead now, and uh, what I'm gonna do is we're gonna bring a, uh, a chair into our scene. And we're going to have our character sit on it. So the next part we're going to talk about is uh, the quick and simple animation. So to do that, I'm going to go into our smart gallery. So the smart gallery is new. In case you guys are not aware of the smart gallery, uh, you can download this um, uh, plugin uh, for iClone. Uh, the smart gallery basically is a really cool plugin that allows you to um, kind of locate all your content a lot easier. So I know like I've had the, I know many, many users have had the problem in the past where they, they download content and then they're like, hey, where the heck is my content? You know, I, on the webpage, it showed all of this stuff and I can't find all the stuff that I'm looking for. Well, thankfully now the smart gallery allows you to search by pack, okay? So 
Um, we're going to be using a couple props from this uh, policeman and uniforms and gears uh, content pack. And this is from one of our uh, um, uh, developers, Antarius. Okay, and you can find his stuff on the content store. I uh, will provide you with a link a little bit later on where you can find this uh, content pack um, called Policeman Uniforms and Gears. Really cool stuff, okay? So we have a corrupt cop that we're gonna bring in a little bit later. Um, but for now, we're just gonna have our character sitting on a chair. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's bring in our chair. So where do we find a chair? Well, I mean, you can go over here to the, um, uh, your content manager. You can always search in your content manager as well. If we go over here to like props, for example, up here, you can search for a, you know, chair. And it's gonna like take a second to, uh, to load up and you can find a bunch of chairs in here. You can see it's taking a while. And it's gonna bring up anything that has the word chair in it. Okay, so we have a bunch of chairs. You can find them this way, okay? Um, so that's using the content manager. But one way to do it is using the smart gallery as well. So in the smart gallery, we have, if I go over here to like new purchases, for example, okay? So basically what I did before this webinar is I downloaded this content pack and you can see these, these content packs that I purchased, this uh, police patrol cars. Um, and you know, you can also go into stuff like, uh, say for example, uh, character packs that I've, that I've downloaded, okay? Now, when they are gray, that means I haven't downloaded them yet, okay? And they'll have this little icon, little cloud icon in the top right. That means they are not downloaded yet, okay? And there's tons of tutorials that you can uh, take a look at on the uh, Smart Gallery. I really recommend checking it out. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to all here and I'm gonna show you the difference. In all, now I'm gonna search for chair in all, okay? And it's not gonna show me the chairs, but it's gonna show me the content packs that all the, that every single content pack that has a chair, okay? So you can see there's tons of stuff that I haven't installed yet. I've recently updated my, uh, my Smart Gallery, so I haven't had time to install it. But all these content packs that show up, they have something in them. They have a chair in them. And I'm going to use this chair from Dawn Starter Pack. You'd be surprised. Does Dawn Starter Pack has a chair? Well, yeah, it certainly does. So you can double click in Dawn Starter Pack, and it's going to open up that pack. And you can see all the stuff that it has in it. There's a whole bunch of uh, um, motions, okay? A whole bunch of different poses. Uh, if you can go to the animations under here, you can find the motions separate. And there's also a whole bunch of different props as well, okay? So that's what's in this starter pack. Uh, you can see tons and tons of poses and, and stuff like that. And the chairs are here just so you can pose with them. All right. So I'm just going to go ahead and click and drag this chair in from the uh, um, smart gallery here. And any questions about the smart gallery, feel free to ask me at any time later on as well. Okay. Okay. So what we're going to do is let's go ahead and have our character um, sitting down on the chair. So we'll just kind of move the chair. Let's hold control and click. Um, on the characters, so we can move them both at the same time. Let's move them both kind of over here a little bit since our uh, evil character is gonna be walking in the background there. Okay, and uh, let's zoom in on the character. Maybe we can get rid of this wall for now since this might get in our way. Let's go to our scene manager and make this invisible. Okay, since we're gonna be focusing on the animation right now. Okay, so the next half, an, half of the hour here is gonna, gonna basically be character animation, lighting, and camera work. So we got a lot to get through really quick. Okay, so let's take our character. I'm going to uh, click on the character, make sure he's selected, press the W hotkey, and move him a little bit forward. So how do you make a character sit on the chair, you may ask? Well, it's actually super, super easy to do. Let's make our smart gallery a little bit smaller since we're not gonna use this anymore. Um, Basically what you want to do is go to your modify tab with your character selected, go up to your uh, animation tab and then use the edit motion layer tool. And we're going to just click our characters uh, hip there and boom, move them down like this. Now, why does that work? Why is it so easy? Because he's, his feet are currently locked and his feet will not move. Okay. That's called human IK. And that allows us to, you know, move different parts of the character's body with other parts locked in place. Okay, and then I'm just gonna press the E hotkey to rotate that slightly. You can also take a look at bone edit mode so you can see the bones themselves. You can see our hip bone there in yellow. If we zoom in really close, you can probably see it a little bit better. Okay, we'll take our characters uh, back just like this. Okay, and what we're going to do is we, have, we want our character's hands to be behind his back, right? Okay, so just to save time, I'm gonna make sure that we have mirror selected here. Okay, mirror. 
I'm going to take my character's uh, arms here. And what we're going to do is we're going to rotate those shoulders backwards, okay? First, we're going to move them down like this by his side, okay? And then we have to kind of rotate them outwards like this, so just, you know, um, because his arms are behind his back and rotate them slightly like this. Okay, generally what helps uh, when you're, you know, modifying your character's uh, poses like this is just kind of do the pose yourself, to be honest. <laughs> and then we'll bring it back a little bit more. Okay, and then we'll take our character's uh, forearms here. And we're going to uh, rotate those forearms even more like this. Okay, let's get rid of the uh, bone edit mode because that kind of di uh, distracts me sometimes. And we want his um, forearms to be kind of out like this, okay? Um, if you think it's getting a little bit too weird, you can take the uh, upper arm and rotate that one a little bit further out, okay, like this. Just make sure you don't, you know, twist it too much because that'll make uh, your character look all weird, all right? So I think, uh, you know, it looks okay from the front, maybe just a little bit like this, okay. And then we'll take our arms and rot rotate those arms inwards like this. Okay, just like that. And uh, that looks fine. We can probably uh, take our chest back a little bit more, or rotate our shoulders back a bit more too. Just like this. Okay, and I'm gonna take my chest and just press the W hockey and move it uh, backward a little bit more. Okay. And there you go. And uh, we're good to go. And uh, I'll take the arms here. They maybe seem rotated a little bit too much. And you wanna make sure that your, your arms are not rotated too crazy. You can have them out like this, but uh, make sure that the arms aren't twisted too much. Okay, that's the main thing. So we'll just kind of put it like this and we'll have his um, hands twisted. Okay, away from each other. We can put those, make those twist even more. Okay, just like this. And we'll go from there. We'll just press the W hotkey and move them closer together, just like this. Okay, and then rotate them upwards like that. And again, just about getting into a nice position that uh, works for everyone. Doesn't make it look too strange. Okay, I think we're good. So what we're gonna do is we're going to bring, whoops, let's go on the other side here. We're gonna bring in our handcuffs now and we're gonna put those handcuffs on the character. And we're gonna talk a little bit about something called Reach Effector, okay? Reach Effector is a really convenient way to animate stuff like um, if your character is on a bicycle, having your character's legs follow along with the pedals of the bicycle. Um, if your character is, is holding a sword, um, having both hands hold the sword and slash. Um, this is very, very, very useful uh, um, thing to use. Um, utilizing, again, human IK. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, I'm going to go to my uh, content manager here. Uh, we'll actually go to the smart gallery. Let's test our smart gallery out one more time. Let's go back to our main folder here and let's type in uh, handcuff. Okay, whoops, did I type that in? Handcuff. Okay, you can see the only handcuffs we have are in this policeman uniforms and gears content pack. So I'm going to double click in there. And you can see we have stuff like batons, bullhorns, flashlights. Uh, wands, all kinds of police equipment, uh, pistols and uh, holsters and all that fun stuff. Again, you can explore that on your own time if you want. I'm just going to type in cuff in this folder here to find it. And there we go. Let's bring our handcuff right now. And you can see, you kind of see them on the ground there. Let's just bring them up to where our character's hands are. Right here. I'm going to make this... Uh, wall invisible as well. So you can see how walls get in the way. Sometimes walls can uh, get in the way. Um, let's make that invisible. Okay, and you can see our handcuffs here. We're gonna focus on a couple of things here. Um, let's just go ahead and take those handcuffs and kind of put them into a relatively a good position here, kind of bring them up like this. Uh, there we go, just like that. Now these handcuffs can actually be separated um, and the way we do that is you can see the handcuffs in the scene manager are made up of a number of different uh, sublinks. Just take those sublinks, uh, sub props rather, and rotate them. And again, I'm using the E and W hotkey interchangeably here, guys. So if you have, um, I'm gonna just get rid of my uh, preference here. You can use Control M to uh, get rid of your snap to model there. We don't need that anymore. 
Um, so let's go ahead and uh, take the entire thing. We need to move it a little bit back here. Okay, I think the one on the right is positioned correctly, but this one is not. So this one right here, again, there are sub props you can rotate and move separately, just like this. And I think that looks fine to me. Again, we can probably rotate a little bit more like this as well and move it up. <clears throat> okay, we'll just work with that, okay? The position of the handcuffs isn't so much what's important, um, but the, uh, the hands and the, the relation of the hands and the handcuffs is what's most important, okay? Let's actually improve our uh, hand position a little bit more on our character as well. <clears throat> Let's use our uh, edit motion layer tool here. I'm just gonna kind of make his hands a little bit more natural looking so they're not so straight out, okay? And you can do that, by the way, by clicking on the palm of in either one of your hands and clicking and dragging to clench them into fists, okay? Very useful little tip there. Okay, so um, our character is supposed to be struggling at the beginning, okay? He's struggling in his handcuffs and um, Again, if, if the camera is not on the handcuffs, you can really cheat here really easily, and I'll show you how. Okay, I'll show you how to cheat first, and then I'll show you the proper way if, if for example, your camera needed to show those handcuffs. So the easiest way to do this, that I would do it, because I'm a lazy animator, is go up here to, if your character's selected, go up to Direct Puppet, okay? And Direct Puppet, with it selected, what I can do is I can go ahead and lock both my hands into place, okay? By clicking these lock buttons. And the T stands for transform, the R stands for rotation. So we're locking them both transform and rotation, okay? You can see lock move and lock rotate. You can disable either one of those if you want. Um, but let's go ahead and take our character's chest. See, we only have a camera view from the front or from like a 45 degree angle like this. We don't need to worry too much about what the handcuff's showing like this, okay? Let's take our character's chest. Let's go to ro uh, primary rotation, okay? And let's go ahead and preview. You can see I can move my character like this and his hands will remain in place, okay? You can see his elbow and his arms. It looks natural, right, from this, from this angle, okay? It doesn't look like the handcuffs are doing anything wrong. However, if we press escape and we go from the back angle, let's see what's actually happening here in the back. So if I preview now, you can see I can move my character's hands outside of the handcuffs Okay, which, um, you know, um, isn't good. So what we want to do is we want to have those handcuffs move along with the character's arms. Now, the best way to do this is to use reach effectors, okay? <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so uh, with reach effectors, uh, let's take our character, make sure our character is selected, and we go down here to edit reach target, okay? And what's going to happen is we're going to go ahead and activate a couple of reach targets. All right, let's do that. Let's take the left hand here, and we're going to go ahead and enable reach effector. Okay, and that brings up a big orange ball. Okay, uh, pretty weird, okay, but it's gonna be useful in just a moment. Let's do the same thing for the right hand, okay? Select this one and select reach effector. And boom, that creates the huge uh, blue ball, okay? So uh, let's go ahead and uh, close that down now. We don't need to worry about this anymore, basically. Okay, so we just have these reach effectors, which are essentially dummies, okay? So they're dummies. If you're not familiar with what a dummy is, a dummy is something that you have in your scene that's not going to show up in the final render. It's just something that's used to, for many, many different purposes. In this case, it's used to uh, attach the hands to, to a certain dummy so we can move the hands by moving the dummy. And I'll show you what I mean in just a moment. So these reach effectors, when you enable them, they actually show up in the underneath your character under reach dummy. Okay, so let's twirl down reach dummy. You can see we have reach dummy right hand, which is the blue um, one right here. And let's just press the R hotkey to scale that down. Okay, just so we can see what's happening. And let's do the same thing for the right hand, or the left hand rather, okay? Let's scale that one down just so we can see what's happening. Okay, so what's happening now is our character's uh, hands are basically locked to those reach dummies. So wherever those reach dummies go, okay, um, that's basically where our character's hand is gonna go, okay? So you can see if I move the reach dummy wherever I want, 
it's going to move my character's entire hand or entire arm rather. Let's press Control Z to undo that. So essentially what we need to do is attach these uh, reach dummies to the handcuffs. Okay, pretty easily done. Uh, we'll take the uh, left hand dummy here and we're going to attach this to the left uh, part of the handcuff here. Okay, so let's go up here with the reach dummy selected, go up to attributes, go down here and go to, you can see right now it's attached to itself. It doesn't really make sense, but you'll see in a second. We'll pick parent and we'll pick the left part of the handcuffs here. Okay, you can see handcuffed left, all set. Okay, now I'm gonna do the same thing for the right uh, hand reach dummy, the blue one. Now we're going to do pick parent and we're gonna pick the other part of the handcuffs there. Okay, now uh, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna take my handcuffs, the entire handcuffs here, and we're going to move those around. Now, if you want, you can make your reach dummies invisible. Um, uh, by, um, you'll see that they're basically down here in the hierarchy now. So you can make that one invisible. Uh, you can make that one invisible just by clicking on them like this. But now what happens, if I, if I select the entire uh, handcuff, I can go over here to my animation, and now we can use the prop puppet. Okay, so prop puppet right here. Uh, a little bit more simple than the, uh, than the um, the direct puppet for the characters. Uh, we just select vertical movement preview and press space. Now you can see when we move the handcuffs around, basically the handcuffs are gonna be dictating the movement of my characters. Again, you don't wanna go to two extremes, but you wanna go ahead and you know something like this, move it around like that. And if we zoom out, let's go to the side a little bit. Okay, you can see that's kind of creating uh, natural arm movement. So what we're going to do is we're going to combine the natural arm movement with the natural chest movement using prop puppet and direct puppet. Okay. Um, but before I do that, I need to figure out the timing um, for my uh, animation. Uh, we don't really need to worry about the timing actually. Let's go ahead and just record this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to record some prop puppet for my handcuffs. Let's go ahead and record that. And uh, Playback, press space. Okay, so now we have, you know, the movement just moving around like this. We have some natural uh, arm movements. Okay, doesn't really matter how long it goes. Maybe this is about 502 frames. And let's do the same thing for the character. So let's close this down and let's select the character. And now we can use that same process where we use direct puppet now for the character and we lock his uh, hands. We don't need to lock his hands actually. We just take his chest and we move the chest around like this. Okay, we need to make sure we go back in time first on the timeline. <laughs> and, uh, okay. The hands need to be locked, okay? I think in this case. Okay, so it's gonna kind of create a combination of the, uh, the two movements together. Um, now one, you know, one, the prop puppet is dictating the movement of the arms. The other, the chest is, the direct puppet is dictating the movement of our character's body. So let's just go ahead and create some animation on our character, rotation on our character's chest here for about five, 500 frames. Okay, press space. Okay, so now his chest is moving independently of his arms. Okay, so he's kind of like struggling. Okay, that's fine. Good, okay. So now we have is we have this in the end. We have our character and the arms are moving separately from the chest. And then we can layer on top of that as well. We can go ahead and take the head. So let's go back to frame one and take the head and use, use primary rotation for the head and just record this. Okay, so now he's like, you know, head's moving around, he's struggling to get out of it like this. Okay. So basically what we've done is we've layered over, you know, three different types of animation to create, you know, it takes 30 seconds to do this and it looks quite natural, but you're basically using your mouse movement to, uh, you know, create a more natural looking animation like this. Okay. And again, we are providing you with a project at the end of this uh, webinar to kind of, um, so you can kind of deconstruct it yourself. Okay. So we need to really get on, get on with this because we only have about uh, 15, 20 minutes left. So let's go ahead and uh, do our first dialogue on our character, which is this guy, he's gonna be struggling. And we'll go ahead and create a script for him. We're gonna get to facial animation now. So create a script. Uh, we're gonna use an audio file that I've already prepared. And we're gonna use this struggling audio file, okay? 
Let me just play back. Uh, <clears throat> get me out of here. Okay. So um, that only goes for about, you know, 400 frames, maybe 360 frames. So what we can do is we can actually make all of those other animations a little bit shorter if we want, but I don't have time for that. So we're going to go on to the next one. Okay. So he's going to be struggling a little bit more after he finishes talking just for a few frames. Okay. Now, another thing that we may want to do is we may want to animate our character's facial expression to make him look a lot more angry or upset. Okay. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to use facial puppet. Okay. I'm using all the quick, quick and quick and dirty animation tools in this, in this procedure here. Um, because we don't have time to go into the more detailed stuff. But Face Puppet is over here in the Modify tab. And we're just going to use like Zane's facial profile. We'll use like an angry profile. If we preview this, you can see, there we go. I can move my mouse around and get an angry profile like this. Uh, we can increase the strength, something like two and a half. And then he looks really angry. He's like, oh gosh, I can't get out of here. Okay. But one thing to keep in mind is because we already did he head animation, we already animated our character's head position, we want to make sure that we disable head rotation, head orientation here on face puppets. So we'll just go ahead and click that. And what'll happen is this, okay? So you can see his head will no longer rotate, but he has that expression and uh, you know, all those muscles are kind of tensing. Okay, just go ahead and record that for like 500 frames. Okay, same thing, record. Ugh. <clears throat> ah, get me out of here. Okay, and he's going to end up like that. Cool. So basically, we've done our character's anim our first character's animation. Now, while this character is doing his uh, is struggling against his handcuffs, we're going to have our corrupt cop character walk behind him. So let's go ahead and find our corrupt cop. Click and drag him in. Again, this is a character that I've uh, created from that content pack, that police content pack. Um, by developer Antarius, and we'll bring this guy in, and we'll just have him walk walk across. Oop, uh oh, <laughs> we replaced the character. So Control Z that. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is if you have your character um, selected and you double click another character, or you bring another character in on top of one, that's how, that's how you can replace characters. Uh, so I need to make sure I click and drag him over here. Okay, we don't want to have him replace the character and the, that just doesn't make sense for the whole dialogue. Okay, so we'll have this guy walk behind the the, um, the thief character, whatever kind of character he is. Um, let's position him properly. Um, you can press the G hotkey to get an overhead view of your character. Okay, um, pretty useful little tip. And press the W hotkey just to move him. Again, that was the G hotkey to get an overhead view. I'm just going to place him over here, rotate him 90 degrees as well. I like to keep my angles clean, so I'll just keep it at 90 degrees here. Z axis, 90 degrees. Whoops, negative 90, facing the other way. There we go. Okay, so there he is. He's basically going to take a little stroll behind our character. Um, let's press W to bring him up a little bit. Okay, that should be fine. Okay, so we need to apply an animation to him really quick. We're going to go to our content manager here under animation. Um, I'm going to go to motion. And this is also from a separate content pack, so just be aware. Um, you won't have this um, motion default, although it's very easy to make walk uh, motion. Okay, this is uh, from the Studio MoCap CD Life Pack. Okay, there's a walk motion in here. And this walk motion is called Wander, L-M-N. It should be called Wander. Um, walk Wander, it's called. Yeah, Walk Wander. This one. Okay, Walk Wander Mail. Okay, let's just apply that to our character. Okay, what's going to happen? This is a root motion. Uh, the character's going to walk uh, behind him. Just get like me this. out of here. Okay, now uh, what I want to do here is I'm going to press F3 to go into my timeline. We're going to have this character uh, walk a little bit slower. Okay, so uh, with the character selected, I'm going to uh, just bring up the timeline a little bit. You can find all of your timeline stuff. Let's just close down our project for now. Um, under here, so uh, you can find all the motions you apply on your character under the motion track. Okay, right here. If I want to make that walk a little bit slower, I can use the speed toggle to stretch it out a little bit. 
and make it a little bit slower, maybe 70%. You can see times 0.7 right there is the speed we have it at now. So now he's kind of walking a little bit slower. Get me out of here. Okay. Now we want the character to stop. We don't we don't want him to stop in this mid uh, mid step pose right here. We want him to stop um, in a different pose, okay? Because he's gonna create, he's gonna have a dialogue. So let's go ahead back down to the uh, folder here and under the chat folder in mocap city life, there's going to be a uh, motion called chat something, chat and mail. Okay, let's just apply this motion. It doesn't really matter where we apply it. You can see right here, we want to pay, pay very close attention to the very first frame of this. Okay, so basically, look at his left foot is forward, his right foot is slightly back. Now, at the end of this clip right here, you can see his left foot is coming forward, but basically, we want a position right here where the left foot is already forward and the right foot is kind of almost going to get into position, okay? So his right foot is currently behind, and this is frame 289. Right here, his right foot is um, a little bit forward, uh, or sorry, his left foot is a little bit forward, and his right foot is a little bit back. So what I want to do here is I want to go ahead and at this frame right here, right here as his left foot is coming forward, I'm going to right click on this clip and I'm going to break it. Okay, and you can see it now creates two clips. I'm going to delete the second one. Now, what's happening here is he's going to change positions just like this. He's going to slide across the floor. And obviously that's something we don't want. And the reason that this happens is because it's a root motion. So when you apply a motion, a motion clip where your character actually moves, it's going to memorize the position where you applied it. So that's why it slides from here to here. If we click on this clip right here, you can see it will slide during this little transition area right here, okay? It'll only start sliding during the transition area. Now there's a couple of ways you can fix this. You can change the transform position but I'm just gonna do this the easy way. I'm going to delete the uh, clip, second clip, and I'm just going to simply reapply it at the last frame of this motion here, okay? So what's gonna happen, we'll just go ahead here and apply it, chat stand, okay? So what's gonna happen now? He will take a step and his right foot will come into position, okay? And you can kind of just uh, click and drag to extend that a little bit, but basically, He'll just kind of walk and he'll stop in that position. Get me out of here. Okay. So after, after the first character has his little, uh, you know, struggle, the second character has his line. So we're going to go ahead and do this. Get me out of here. Okay. Now right about here, the second character needs to have his first line. So let's select him. And let's go to our uh, modify. Again, same process. Create a script, audio file, and... This one here, I already told you, okay? So what does he say? He says, I already no, told you, I don't know where the money is. <laughs> We're gonna need to go to delete that. So let's go to our uh, advising track here for our corrupt cop and simply just delete that audio file right there, okay. Um, this one, he's going to say, audio file, we know you have the money. Okay, so right here. We know you have the money, Lebowski, and you're going to tell us one way or the other. Okay, and just for to make things easier, I'm going to simply apply the next uh, part of this dialogue to our th uh, the third part of our dialogue to our other character. Okay, and we'll talk about um, the camera stuff in just a moment. So I'm going to select my other character and create script, audio file, and already told you. Okay, so then we have this. I already told you, I don't know where the money is. Just let me go. Okay, so that's, basic, that's basically the duration of our entire project. Now, a couple things we need to do here. The first thing I wanna do is I wanna have my cop character look at the thief as he's walking by. So you can use this function called look at, okay? So let's select our cop character. Um, by the way, I recommend having this uh, object-related track 
um, thing enabled on your timeline because every time you select something, it's going to load that up in the timeline, okay? So you can see corrupt cop, have in right here, corrupt cop. Okay, so look at can be found over here under attributes. Um, we're going to go down to the look at feature, pick target, and we're gonna pick Kevin, all right? And you can adjust the amount of look at from your head to your eye, okay? So right now you could have it, he'll have more of his head tilted or more of just an eye look at, okay? So let's go ahead and play back and you'll see, I'm just gonna scroll through the timeline rather, and you'll see the police character will look at Kevin. Uh, we'll call him Kevin, okay, just because for simplicity's sake, okay? So you can see he'll look at Kevin, but then it looks a little bit weird, you know, as he, as he walks by, um, he's, you know, kind of a little bit, um, maybe his, his neck is a little bit too cramped, um, looking at Kevin from behind. So what he's gonna do is that maybe at this point here, we're gonna go ahead and select set free. Okay, and that's gonna set his, uh, it's gonna release the restriction on the character's head. And if you wanna see where that restriction takes place, you can go into your character's tracks and go to constraint, okay? So you can see constraint, if we twirl that down, there's a look at line that goes from here to here. Okay, so he's looking at him and then gradually, he'll begin to stop looking at him, okay? And it gradually progresses throughout the duration um, of the look at. So it'll take a brief look at the beginning. His head will slightly be tilted still here. And then back to the regular position at the set free right here. Okay, so this keyframe is where it sets free. Okay, so that's all I want to show you for that. I think we can move on now to the camera work and the lighting. Um, so let's go ahead and do that. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, select my camera, do my camera work first, okay? So for cameras, I'm gonna create a camera really quick. Create up here and create camera. This is gonna be our first camera. It's gonna be our first scene, basically looking at our character, uh, looking at Kevin. So let's zoom in really quick. And it's gonna be like a mid, kind of a mid shot for our character, but like this, because we, we, we wanna see the police officer kind of walking in the background. Okay, so we'll set our camera like that. If we scrub through the timeline, there you can see him walking in the background, right behind Kevin as he's struggling to get out of the handcuffs. Okay, now one thing I want to do here is I want to make sure that I have depth of field selected because we don't want to have the background focus on the on the police officer. We want to have the the camera focus on Kevin here. So it doesn't really matter what frame we're at, frame 143, whatever, as long as Kevin and the police officer are both in the scene at the same time. I'm gonna make sure I have my camera selected down here and go over here to attributes. And we're gonna activate depth of field, okay? So I'm gonna pick target and I'm gonna pick Kevin's face, okay? And you can see that the police officer in the background is still relatively in focus. Um, and that's because we need to go ahead and change our near transition region, okay? So you can see here, if we take that down to about like 88 or something like that, 92, whatever, the police officer in the background will be blurred out and we'll, we'll see Kevin's face. Now, what you need to do is you need to make sure that that happens throughout the entire timeline. So we'll press F3 to go into our timeline with our camera selected and we'll select our camera depth of field, okay? And you can see there's one little lone keyframe there. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and click and drag that keyframe all the way down to frame one, okay? Because we don't wanna change that depth of field. Okay, and that's really all we're gonna do for camera one. It's just a really simple depth of field. So let's go ahead and play back. Uh, uh, get me out of here. We know. Okay, so there we have that. And uh, the camera two is gonna probably occur right about the time that Kevin stopped struggling. So let's go ahead and create another camera. Create camera. And we'll just call this whatever, camera two, it doesn't matter. And the initial position of this camera is going to be right about here. So we're gonna have Kevin in the background like this. Now, one thing I can do here is because the camera is a little bit, uh, um, because Kevin seems a little bit far off in the distance, we want Kevin to seem a little bit closer. We can actually change our camera's uh, focal length. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm gonna select my camera too. 
and we're going to go up here. Whoops. Oh, I want to close down. Go up here and change to like 80 millimeter or even 105 millimeter. And you can see when we do that, basically the camera looks, or Kevin looks like he's a lot closer in the background. Okay. And this is probably something we want if we want, because basically we're going to transition from one character talking to the next. Okay. So let's go ahead and use an angle like something like this. I think will be fine. Okay. And at the, at the front, we're going to have the camera again, we need to select the camera. Oops. Gosh, I just ruined everything. My, oh, my position there. I accidentally pressed something on the timeline there. Um, bring it back. Oh, I changed to our preview camera. Okay, good. Okay, so uh, we'll have this and we need to make sure we have our depth of field set. So with uh, camera zero selected, let's go ahead and change our depth of field. Make sure it's pick target on this dude right here. And again, we'll twirl down, we'll go to lens and depth of field. And we need to change both of those to the very beginning since we don't want to change the depth of field at this point. Not right now anyways, okay? So what we're gonna do is this camera here. Oh, <clears throat> oh, get me out of here. We know you have the okay, money. So about, about this point here, we want to switch to camera two. Okay, so we're gonna go to our project tab, our project uh, track rather, up here. And you can see there's a switcher uh, track in the projects, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just basically right click on the very first frame of the switcher track and go to camera list and select camera. Okay. And then when we want our second, ca our second camera to be active, which is about right here, then we want to switch to our second camera. So all we do is right click in that track and camera list camera zero. Okay. So then if I go to switcher, right here, my switch camera on the top. What's gonna happen, let's close our timeline down since we don't really need it at this point. Oh, <clears throat> oh, get me out of here. We know you have the money, Lebowski, and you're going to tell us one way or the other. I already told you, I don't know where the money is. Just let me go. Okay, so that's basically it. So that's the dialogue. Let's go ahead and really quickly do our lighting in the next uh, couple minutes here. <laughs> Apologies for going a little bit over time. Let's go ahead and do that really quick. So I'm going to, for lighting, I'm going to switch to our preview camera uh, since we don't want to um, move anything around. And uh, let's go ahead and bring our uh, walls and everything back up. So let's go to our walls, make sure all the walls are visible like this. We don't need to worry about the, uh, the ceiling right now. Um, let's just go ahead and do the lighting to take care of the lighting first. So I'm gonna start from scratch with the lighting. So I'm gonna delete all the lights in the scene. So let's go down here to lights and I'm gonna select the key light, delete, side light, delete, backlight, delete. You can see there's still light in the scene. You're like, what the heck? Why is there still light in the scene if I deleted all the lights? That's yeah, because we have image-based lighting. Let's go to our visual tab here and we're gonna go down to activate IBL and we can just disable it if we want. Doesn't really matter. We can activate it like a very slight bit. We can adjust the strength to make it a little, you know, maybe like a value of one or something like that. But you can see the IBL basically, if we don't have any IBL, it goes pitch black, okay? Let's make our cameras invisible there as well. Those always bother me. Um, okay, so no IBL. Basically our scene is pitch black. We can't see any of our characters. Um, let's go ahead and add a spotlight into our scene. This is gonna be directly above our character. And for this, we're gonna just, you know, bring our IBL up like this. Okay, it doesn't really matter. We're gonna delete it in the, in the end. Okay, and I'm gonna go ahead and create light and create spotlight. Okay, and I'm going to align my spotlight really quickly using this option up here, align to. Align to my character X, and Y, and we can even do Z uh, right there. It's basically sitting on his lap right now, okay? And uh, what we're gonna do is uh, just get rid of this wall here, just temporarily. Zoop. 
and make sure that light is selected. Press the W hot key. We're going to move it up like this. And it's basically directly above our character. Um, you can see it's rotated slightly and we don't want that. So let's go ahead and press the E hot key to rotate it. We want it to be facing directly onto our character's head. So again, you can see the rotation values right here on the top. Our X should be zero. Everything should be zero. So it's basically shining directly down on our character's head. And that's exactly what we want. Maybe a little bit higher. So I'll press the W hot key. Move it up like this. Now, because I'm doing this all at frame 957, which is a bad idea, I need to right click on my uh, light there and go remove object animation. Okay, let's go to visual and let's deactivate IBL. Okay, so once, you, once that happens, you can see we have a much more, uh, you know, ominous type of, type of look right here. Um, it's just kind of shining directly down on our character's face. Um, what we can do is maybe move it a little bit forward slightly. Okay, this is like very dark and dramatic lighting. Let's move it a little bit forward, just slightly. Okay, and we also want to do something called global illumination. So, uh, and just adjust the, uh, adjust the shadows slightly, okay? Adjusting the shadows is very important. Um, let's go to our, our spotlight here, first of all. And on the top value here, we want our shadow darkness to be maximum, okay? Um, you can adjust the multiplier value of your light to make it brighter, which I suggest in this situation. Okay. Um, maybe a value of like five or something. And we want to go over to our visual tab as well. We want to adjust our shadows. Um, we want to adjust the shadow strength. Okay. I like to have strength like this, like a very, very, especially for a scene like this, you can see it looks like the movie Hitman or the, the TV show Hitman or something like that. The video game, not the TV show uh, Hitman. Okay. And uh, this value right here is exactly what we want. So we can also change the resolution to a bit higher if we want, like 2048. It really depends on the scenario. And you can also adjust the bias. If we have a bias of zero, um, it really depends. Sometimes you'll have shadow clipping. So you may want to adjust the bias to like maybe minus two or something like that. Okay. You can see it looks very nice and very ominous. Um, you can adjust the global darkness multiplier as well to really further enhance that, uh, that shadow. Um, but we also want it to be a bit more realistic as well. We want to have light reflecting off of things. So let's go to global illumination here and enable global illumination. And you can see with global illumination enabled, it kind of shows us a little bit more of our character's face. Now, I don't really want a ton of my character's face to be shown. Um, so what I can do is I can just go ahead and you know, decrease ambient strength a little bit. And bounce strength is the number one thing we want to kind of take down, as well as uh, the specular, OK? And you can see the results right there. So if we increase specular, again, the value low just adds a little bit of detail onto our character's face. If you increase the balance strength quite, quite, uh, by quite a lot, you'll see the result right there, okay? So because we want to maintain a very kind of ominous uh, scene, we can take a very, very low value for balance strength for our diffuse, okay? There's tons and tons of uh, time I can take to go into uh, our our uh, settings here for global illumination, but let's go ahead and keep it at that. And uh, we want one more light in our scene, and this is gonna be the final light, and then we'll play back our, our entire sequence. Okay, and this light is gonna be illuminating our police officer. So let's go ahead to our content manager and to props, and under props, there are some lights, okay? There are some light tools right here, and these come embedded with, uh, with iClone ever since iClone 6. Very useful little little tools that I use all the time for quick and easy lighting. Um, let's make sure we go back to, uh, we can actually do it in this frame here. Let's click and drag our light, this fluorescent lamp. I'm gonna move this up on the Z axis and uh, you can see we can place it over here somewhere. But basically we wanna place it where uh, we can see the character's face or the uh, police officer's face. So maybe something like this, okay. Um, if you want to take a look at how it looks like on the care, on the police officer's face in the scene, you can press the F8 hotkey and that opens your mini viewport. You can change your mini viewport camera to camera zero. Okay. And if we move this around, you can see where the light is going to be cast. Okay. So we want the light to be maybe about here. It looks pretty good further back and there we'll just keep it there. Right click and select 
remove object animation because we don't want that movement to be throughout the entire timeline. And then I'm going to take this light. I'm going to control click and duplicate it and move it over here. Another one over here so we can see the wall behind our character. Okay, just in this particular scene. So it'll be like over here. Okay, and again, right click and remove object animation. Okay, so let's go ahead, let's close these down. We don't need these prop uh, things right here. Uh, let's close down our mini viewport. Let's go to our switch camera. And okay, lighting's not terrible. Okay, it could be better, but we can adjust that later. Again, these details can be a little bit tricky. So, hey, this is the scene we have right now. Um, let's go and uh, make our light invisible as well because that, uh, that gray line is kind of annoying me. Okay, so this is our final light of scene right here. Ugh. <clears throat> Ugh. Get me out of here. We know you have the money, Lebowski, and you're going to tell us. <laughs> Make sure we have that back wall shown. Yeah, there we go. And again, I... One way or the other. I already told you, I don't know where the money is. Just let me go. Okay, in that last scene, where you, that last uh, um, dialogue where Lebowski, his name is, um, is talking back to the police officer, what we can do is we want to go ahead and, and, and uh, change the camera focus as well. One last little quick thing here um, for the depth of field. I'm going to press F3, go to our timeline here with camera zero selected. Um, let's take the depth of field keyframe right here. I'm going to right click and copy it. And we're going to paste it right here. Okay. As our police officer finishes talking, we're going to place it right there. And then as uh, um, Kevin starts talking, we're going to go over here and choose a new target. Okay, pick target, and then we're going to pick Kevin. All right, so that, what's going to happen is between this screen here, or this frame here, and this frame here, you're going to see a transition uh, for the depth of field. It's going to transition between from one character to the next. Okay, so the police officer is in focus right here. And over here, is, uh, focused on, um, you know, Kevin, right? Then we can just, you know, use direct puppet for him, but we'll go ahead and take care of that later. Yeah, it's basically the scene. And, uh, you know, if I wasn't trying to explain every step along the way, I could probably whip out that scene in like, you know, uh, half an hour or something like that. But, uh, you know, explaining things as you go along takes a little bit longer. But it just kind of goes to show you how you, you can do a nice, you know, like 30 second scene uh, really quickly. Um, again, I'd rather tweak the lights, uh, tweak the materials maybe. Um, stuff like that takes a lot of back and forth, which is really monotonous to show on a webinar. But I just wanted to essentially show you guys the workflow uh, moving along here. Um, how, I, how I normally would uh, create a scene like this myself. Um, and, uh, you know, starting from scratch with absolutely nothing in the scene. Now we have characters, we have animations, we have um, materials, lights, and cameras, and all that stuff. So um, that's about all I want to show you guys. Again, apologies for going a little bit over time here. Um, let's go ahead and get to our Q&A um, without much further ado. And uh, we'll try to get to your questions uh, throughout the next uh, little bit here. Okay, first question comes from uh, <coughs> Alan Scott. Alan says, is LiveLink still to be produced in-house? And how long will it be supported and updated? Um, in uh, for Unreal Live Link, yeah, it's basically produced in house. That's our plugin uh, for Unreal, and it's going to be supported and updated for the foreseeable future. Uh, we have no, we've basically just started it, so we have no plans to uh, to uh, kill that at all. In fact, we're going to probably improve it, and we're going to be focused on you know making our st our stuff compatible with uh, Unreal and Unity as much as possible going into the future. Um, okay, Alan asks another good question. Will popcorn effects transfer from iClone to uh, Unreal Engine in LiveLink? Uh, not yet. We don't have the option to transfer popcorn effects. Um, but that's something we're working on for a future version. Uh, like I mentioned, we are focusing on improving that and things like prop transfer and uh, popcorn effects are, are things that we're looking at uh, you know, in integrating into our Unreal LiveLink in the future there. Okay. 
okay, so lay two is having a problem installing iClone 7. Um, if you have a problem installing iClone 7, uh, that's definitely an issue for uh, customer support. Um, so I'll recommend uh, checking, uh, sending a message off to customer support here. I'll go to our uh, website and show you where to find uh, customer support in case you're not uh, aware. Just go up here to uh, your, um, rather up here, um, and you want to go to support and you want to go to customer service. I'll copy and paste that link into the chat window for you guys. Okay. Um, ba -da -ba -ba. Okay, customer support, you can get in touch with them there. Make sure you logged into your Reillusion account before you do that, okay? Okie dokes. Um, next question from Ajit, is this available for free? Um, you, can, you can download a free 30-day trial of iClone. Again, like I mentioned, uh, some of the content that I used was uh, paid content uh, from the content store. Um, if you wanna go to the content store, you can go to stores here. And I'll put a link for the content store as well. Uh, in the chat chatterbox window. That's the content store. Um, yeah, the Substance 200 pack uh, is from the content store. Uh, the police officer and the police accessories were all from the content store. Um, I, th I believe that's the only things that I used that were in the content store. So I tried to keep it as simple as possible. Um, with, oh, and, and the chair. But again, chairs, you can get a chair anywhere. You can get a chair for free off of, uh, you know, whatever, 3D warehouse. Um, yeah, but uh, the, the, there's only a 30-day trial for iClone. Uh, some of the content I, I uh, had to purchase. Okay, a question from uh, Rosemary. Is it better to use a wall if you want to create a background for a scene? I'm creating a scene, but the background is taking the entire back of the scene. Um, yeah, Rosemary, honestly, it really depends on the situation. But honestly, for myself, I prefer to use um, walls just because they're more flexible. Um, props in general are the most flexible things in the entire iClone environment. <clears throat> you can attach them to each other, you can resize them, you can uh, adjust them in various ways. Um, when you import something as a background specifically, you're a little bit limited in, <laughs> ironically, into the ways you can use it as a background. Um, so often I, I try to use um, as much as possible props um, for my backgrounds. Um, you know, in, unless it's like, you know, uh, um, something like clouds in the distance. If it's clouds in the distance, then it's easier just to use like, a, you know, uh, an atmosphere material or something like that. Um, but if it's, you know, if it's limited camera uh, visuals, your camera um, cone of vision is, is limited, then uh, yeah, definitely use um, a wall as, as a prop, as a background. Um, and any more questions about that, feel free to just, uh, you know, elaborate a bit more on, on the details there. Uh, but that's what I can offer you for now. Um, okay, question from Jerry. Uh, can you explain what substance baking does to affect the file size and how much of a file size change there are? <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so the uh, substance, basically, the reason I bake a substance is like I mentioned, to conserve resources when I'm doing live editing. Um, if I don't bake a substance and I have like a whole bunch of, you know, substance materials in my scene and I don't bake them, it's going to really lag my computer. And this is, you know, due to uh, limited processing size again, but you don't really need to have the substances unbaked unless you're going to modify them, um, in real time through your scene. So it does, it does reduce the size of the files. Um, I'll show you another cool thing about uh, 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 baking and it also about copying um, um, one wall to the next. So if you recall, I, I used a control click and drag to copy one frame or one, one wall, okay, to make a duplicate of that wall. Uh, let's take a look at this wall. I think this is one of the walls. Notice on this wall here, we have these little link um, icons, right, in the bottom left, okay? These little link icons basically mean that they're attached. They're using data from another texture. So I think the original texture was this one over here. Maybe not. I'm not sure which one it was, but uh, one of them is the original. And that uh, material 
is basically being um, linked. So what you're doing here, because these textures are linked, you're saving lots of resources um, because when you modify this one, it's gonna modify all of them. So it's essentially every, every prop is drawing from the same material resource and as opposed to drawing from their own separate material resources. And that saves, that saves a lot of resources in your, in your scene. Uh, makes it operate faster, makes it uh, easier to navigate and uh, in so many ways. Um, and of course, these textures, the individual texture JPEGs by themselves, again, these are just simple JPEGs now because they've been baked. Uh, these are obviously a lot lower resource than uh, substance material. Um, hopefully that uh, clears that for you there. And again, any, 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 uh, if you guys want any elaboration, you can always feel free to just uh, contact or put another question in the Q&A panel there. All right, a uh, question from Josh. If I were to make a room to export into Unity, is there a way to export all the parts as a group or, or a single mesh? Um, to follow up on that, can the number of materials be simplified? Uh, basically, the way to export everything as a group or a single mesh is the way that I just uh, showed. I demonstrated, you know, attaching one wall to the next. Um, basically, you just attach everything to everything. So you can see here, I have a number of different walls. Um, what I would just do is I would select this wall, go over to attributes and uh, attach to pick parent and just pick like this wall, okay? And then I would just do the same thing, this wall, pick parent and attach to this wall. And this wall, again, you can see the process here, pick parent. Uh, going to this wall, this wall, pick parent, going to this wall. Okay, so now we have one wall prop that contains a number of different sub props, uh, sub meshes, and they will be in FBX format um, for our main prop. So I select wall 001, file export as FBX. Okay, and then you just export, basically the entire room would be exported as an FBX in that case, okay? Hopefully that's uh, that's clear as mud. Uh, for materials, yeah. Um, when you import your uh, your props into Unreal uh, or Unity, whatever you're using, um, there's an automatic setup um, tool uh, plugin we have for Unreal and, and Unity that basically auto assigns all the materials in the most efficient way possible. So again, it's very easy compared to before to import your characters and your props into uh, into these game engines because the auto setup plugin that we provided for you guys, and again, it's free for, uh, um, free with uh, Character Creator 3 Pipeline, is um, it, it optimizes all of those materials for you when you import into Unreal or uh, Unity. <coughs> okay, uh, Rosemary asks, can you play a video on a wall? Yeah, you definitely can. Um, all you gotta do is click and drag the video onto the wall, basically. I'm not sure if I have any videos to demonstrate on, but, uh, if anyone's curious about how to uh, put a uh, video on a wall, let's take a 3D prop here, <coughs> 3D block, and uh, where's our wall here? Oh, go into walls and floors. Doesn't really matter which wall, this one's fine. Let's see if I have a video somewhere. Let's take up our ambient occlusion, just so we can actually see something. Uh, okay, so videos probably somewhere here. Let's see if we have this, uh, yeah, I have a video. This is a cartoon animator for a video. You can drag it onto your prop just like this. And boom. Told you, I don't know where the money is. Jim, you really should take a break from animating. You've been at it for hours. Okay. Again, you would have to kind of probably uh, make sure that that video is um, go down to materials and probably you'd want to uh, um, change the UV settings to like a box, for example, and apply it or clean maybe and apply it. Nope, box Y axis and apply it or box Z axis and apply it. There you go. Um, that's how you would kind of make sure hey, that- uh, thanks. We'll do. Video or, or material, there's all sorts of materials as well. I think I might have screwed something up here. Um, basically uh, applies to your uh, your wall or whatever you have, okay? 
All right, so I'm going to go back to the Q&A. And uh, Rosemary asks, when should you use full body and body part on edit motion layer? Um, it depends on if you want to move the full body or the individual body part. <laughs> There's different scenarios for both. Um, let's go ahead and delete this. Um, again, yeah, different scenarios for both um, with our character selected here, for example. Gonna, um, whoops, that's his vest we selected. Uh, motion layer tool. Um, yeah, it, re it really depends. Um, realistic shoulder is uh, one thing one thing that you want to make sure you have enabled in most cases. Um, uh, the keying mode, um, body part and full body, this is only for the individual keys. So <clears throat> this gets into a bit more detail on animation stuff, but essentially, say for example, I decide to move my character's hand. Uh, let's take a look at our character, our cop character. And I selected his, uh, his hand. Uh, what do we have selected here? We have something weird selected. We have him selected. Okay. Um, motion layer tool. If we only use body part for keying mode, and we select his left hand, we move it just like that. It's only going to add a keyframe for um, his. Let's go ahead and close down constraint. If we go into motion, it's only going to add a keyframe. Uh, whoops, we need to select the cop. Uh, yeah, it's only going to add a keyframe for his, uh, for his hand. Okay, so under motion layer, you can see here, basically it only added a keyframe under the arm. Okay, it didn't add a keyframe under the entire body. If we select full body and we move that, basically it creates a keyframe for the entire body. Okay, so it, it just depends if you want to um, animate the hand separately or have the entire body have a keyframe. There's various scenarios that uh, would require this, and I don't have much time to go into detail, unfortunately. But uh, yeah, that's uh, what the difference, okay? When you go into your motion layer uh, track here, uh, it's the difference between your uh, only having a keyframe for the arm and having a keyframe for the entire body. Um, for more detailed animations, you only want for the, for the arm. Okay, um, hopefully that answers that question for you. Uh, Ryan asks, when doing rotation keyframes from two different motion clips, how do you prevent a full 360 tween in the wrong direction? <coughs> so Ryan, um, very important to note here that uh, certain animations, like I mentioned, are going to be uh, um, applied at a certain angle. Um, uh, they'll just basically default to your character's zero degree profile angle. And the only way to, uh, to fix that is to just change the transform position. So if I wanted my character, for example, when he's walking, excuse me, uh, back here, um, if I rotated him, you know, uh, this way, press him to eat, uh, do we have him selected? Yeah, I should have it. There we go. <clears throat> if I rotate him this way at frame one, what's going to happen is he's going to, uh, you know, um, when he moves along like this, he's going to basically just be walking sideways. Okay. Um, so when you when you apply a motion, <coughs> when you apply a root motion like I've done, you want to make sure that your character is in the right um, right um, angle profile initially. Okay, so you want to make sure he's facing the direction you want him to walk in or you want him to move in. Um, again, that's all with the transform position, which is this keyframe, uh, this track up here, uh, transform. Okay, now you can see there's a keyframe right there, uh, frame one, and you can rotate that whichever direction you want. Um, if you want more elaboration on that, I'm, I'll be happy to answer that. But uh, for now, I'll just move on to the next question since we have a kind of a backup here. A uh, question from uh, Kara, uh, Kara, how do you make a harbor side scene? <laughs> um, maybe we can have a future webinar where I can just spend the entire webinar creating a harbor side scene with water and sky and all that stuff. Um, if you want to, if you want a webinar like that in the future, like a beginner's webinar, um, feel free to put that in the, in the feedback form that we're sending out to you guys. 
Um, again, we're always looking for new ideas and, and uh, you know, ways to um, help our users, um, you know, get into the software easier, lower the learning curve. Um, so, you know, anything we can help with, um, definitely put that in the feedback form that we're going to email to you guys and you get the 10% from the content store as well. Uh, but yeah, making this Harbor uh, side scene, it's a lot more complex than I have time to, uh, to go through in the Q and A, but, uh, a lot of the same, a lot of the same procedures, a lot of the same uh, functions that I showed you, um, how you can be, uh, used making a Harbor seat, a Harbor side scene as well. <clears throat> Okay, question from Christina. I noticed there's a comprehensive course for iClone 6 selling on your website. Will this course be updated for iClone 7? Um, probably not at this point. I don't think we have any particular plans to uh, update that course, um, but we do have a ton of tutorials uh, for iClone 7. Um, if you want, you can go just to um, whatever uh, software you're looking at. In this case, it's iClone 7. Um, and go over here to learn and tutorials. Okay. And all the video tutorials here are categorized, uh, in their various uh, categories. It's basically the same thing. Okay. We, we have all this stuff here. It's fairly comprehensive and categorized. I'll throw this in the chat window for you guys as well. There you go. <clears throat> and, uh, yeah, so we don't have that plan for iPhone 7. That's why I can say that definitively. <clears throat> okay, question from Kim. Uh, is iClone mocap compatible with Intel RealSense cameras? If not, will they be? Uh, right now, we're not currently compatible with Intel RealSense cameras. Um, the facial mocap is compatible with any sort of, uh, any sort of uh, webcam. Um, but I'm not familiar with Intel RealSense cameras. Uh, but I haven't heard anything about it, but if it's the webcam, it'll be fine. Um, but, uh, unfortunately I'm not really familiar with those, those cameras. Um, but, uh, for body, for body animation, if, if it's for body animation, body mocap, I haven't heard anything. So I, unfortunately I can say it won't be compatible. Uh, so apologies for that, Kim. <coughs> Excuse me. A uh, question from Cheryl. Uh, the handcuffs aren't joined. How would you do that? So you can take a close up shot. Um, good point. Um, what I found with these handcuffs when I was using them is that uh, you can actually uh, separate them in 3D Exchange. So uh, I'll show you really quickly um, in 3D Exchange. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, you can separate different meshes. So if I take those uh, handcuffs uh, into 3D Exchange, um, where are they here? Um, handcuffs, there we go. <coughs> Excuse me, uh, edit in 3D exchange. Let's take a look at them. Um, because indeed, as you noticed, one of the links is, uh, you know, a little bit off. Um, this, that is this, whoops, holy crap. Uh, this middle one right here. So this little sub one right here, handcuff chain link two. And there's this one here, which is chain link one. So what you gotta do is this one, you gotta make a sub prompt. Okay, just like this up here, make sub prop. And once you do that, you can move it around separately. Okay, because currently the way it is, um, it's, par it's part of this one. Okay, uh, and it, it, it won't move uh, when it's part of this one. So uh, if I have it like this, let's go ahead and export it to the iClone, whatever. Um, let's take it to, uh, let's just go to our desktop first. Okay, so I'll show you the difference. Oops. I hope it didn't overwrite something important there. Um, temp avatar, okay. Uh, bring it to iClone. Um, press F to focus on it. And bring it above ground, right here. So now we have uh, three sections, okay? So we have, the other one we only have two sections. I uh, just so need to reset the pivot point. Okay. So you see now this middle link is entirely separate from the other two. Okay. So if you come across a situation like that, just take it into 3D exchange, uh, take the mesh that you want to separate and uh, make it into a sub prop. Okay. And then you can move them all separately like this. Okay. And position that middle chain link wherever you want, wherever you want it to be. 
All right, hopefully that helps. Uh, that's a, actually a really useful little tip um, for a lot of, a lot of props um, that may not be performing as you want them to perform. Uh, just keep that in mind. Um, another question from Rosemary. When setting up cameras, is it better to use camera or preview mode? And what's the benefit of whichever one you use? Um, when I'm setting up cameras, uh, and again, apologies for going through the camera part super fast, but uh, when setting up cameras, I always use preview cameras. Um, now, uh, what I did in, in, the, in the process of uh, setting up the cameras in this webinar is I used the mini viewport, okay? Um, so you can go to uh, window and mini viewport or use the F8 hotkey. And you can assign this mini viewport to a separate camera. And this is always a good way, like I, 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 I like to keep my main, my main uh, work window as a preview camera and set the mini viewport to my other camera. Just because, you know, in the mini viewport, it's, it's a bad render quality, but you don't need to worry about that. You just need to worry about camera placement, right? So, uh, and if you have in your main viewport, if you have it set to like camera, say I'm at frame, whatever, frame 300 something, and uh, I have my camera selected, right, um, and I move it, uh, whoops, it's gonna add a keyframe there for my transform, okay? It's gonna add a transform keyframe. So that way from here to here, it's moving. No, I didn't want it to move, so it's moving from here to here. Like maybe a hit, So, and then if you know, see I'm not paying attention and I go here and I'm like, oh, let's check out this guy, for example, and then, and we have this <laughs> camera movement. Uh, but again, all you have to do is just delete all these. You can click and drag and just delete them. And they're gone. But sometimes it's annoying. You know, you're at a, a certain frame and you want to adjust the camera and then you just realize, oh crap, I was adjusting the, the keyframe camera. I was adjusting the uh, camera one. And now it's adding a bunch of keyframes into my uh, camera track. Um, so then you have to go back and delete them all, but uh, that can be annoying. So I try and keep it on preview as much as possible. Um, so plan original asks, where is the camera list again? Um, camera list is up here uh, under the un under the toolbar. Uh, the camera list can be here. You can also find your cameras down here again in the uh, C manager. Um, those are the two places where you can go to find your cameras. Um, you can go to create and create camera from here as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, if I have my character selected and I press the, uh, oops. Oh, crap. Where's my camera? There we go. And I press the O hotkey rather. It'll go back to my uh, previously used camera. So if I select my character and I press O, what's going to happen? is gonna basically load up my camera properties, okay? Uh, very important to note there. You can toggle between your camera and your, uh, wait, is that the third one? It used to be O. Maybe it's changed. H, no. Um, H is to tr uh, transition between your camera and your preview, but it's supposed to change the modify as well. Let me get back to you on that. <laughs> That's a keyframe I haven't used in a long time. Um, okay, next question from Plan Original as well. Uh, is the folder for IBLs located in the computer? I changed it to another folder and then I couldn't find it again. Um, yeah, I think so. Um, to find your folder, you can just go ahead and uh, um, uh, load from here should be able to. Oh, mine's mine's different too. Uh, so my structure is going to be different from a lot of people. Um, I have mine in uh, content. It's going to be under template. Um, iClone Seven template. Um, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> it should be here. Um, IBL somewhere around here. Uh, maybe an atmosphere or material library. It's in this folder anyways, under your iClone template, it should be there. Uh, now you're gonna have a, a much different uh, a file path. Um, yeah, there's, a, I think it's under HDRI here, uh, or, or one of these anyways. Uh, dynamic IBL, here you go. Um, yeah, these ones are gonna be um, where your IBL stuff is. 
Um, what's it uh, asking for? Oh, JPEGs and VMPs and stuff. Um, yeah, you can simply just uh, assign this folder. Uh, I believe it's iClone template and atmosphere. I'm like 90% sure. Uh, maybe someone else can take a look on theirs and just put it in the chat window really quick just to make sure. But uh, HDR setting. The default one. Nope, not image layer. I'm pretty sure it's in atmosphere. But uh, if someone finds otherwise, um, because that's where all those uh, files were that I just looked at, um, it should be in there. Uh, I believe so. If anyone else finds something different, put in the chat window. Uh, some of you must have it for by default. But uh, um, yeah, you should be able to find it there. Um, uh, OK, so another question from Josh. How can you get some of those light effects with a tune shader? Um, tune shader light effects. Um, well, if you're familiar with tune shader, um, we can make this into a tune shader uh, scene right now by activating tune shader. Um, that's up here under uh, tune shader tab under visual. Um, you can adjust stuff here. I'm not sure uh, what um, light effects you're, you're talking about there, uh, um, Josh, but uh, you can adjust, you know, all the various values. Again, you can just mess around with these to kind of see exactly what they do. Um, it's not not too tricky to, to figure this out. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm not gonna go into too much detail since I'm not really totally sure. You can maybe elaborate and I can go into more detail um, with the tune shader, but that's where you can find it anyways. Um, Anthony Cooper asks at frame 562, the light doesn't seem to be affecting both brick walls. The fall off doesn't seem natural. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you can uh, obviously adjust um, the amount of light, the direction of the light. It's going to totally change. Um, lighting is one thing that, I mean, every, every professional um, animation has a whole department of, just for lighting, you know. So um, me doing it by myself in like five minutes is not going to be <laughs> the ideal result. Um, lighting takes a lot of tweaking. Um, I would probably want to change the lighting colors, the lighting shapes. Uh, you can create emissive lights, um, which are a lot more effective in some cases, um, especially with global illumination. Um, a lot of different lighting stuff we can do. But uh, yeah, overall, the seed, uh, it's sort of effective, I guess, but it's a, it's a very hastily put together scene. So uh, thanks for the compliment. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I go on from there. Um, Stephanie asks, can we bring in DAS 3D props? Yeah, you definitely can. Um, DAS stuff you can bring in, FBX, OBJ, uh, BVH format, um, whatever format you want. All those formats you can bring in via 3D Exchange. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> next question, Ralph. Uh, how do you properly keyframe characters when iClone is set at 60 frames per second and regular animation is at 20 frames per second? Um, you can adjust, I believe, the uh, frames per second. Um, I believe it's in the project settings. Um, or when you, uh, <coughs> excuse me, when you render it out, it should be here. Or maybe it's in the preferences. I haven't done this in a long time. Uh, I do believe there is a uh, frames per second adjustment here though. Hmm, maybe not. No, I, I believe it's in the render export. Um, yeah, that, that's one thing that we were actually working on uh, recently, I remember, um, trying to get these uh, um, harmonized, the uh, frames per second that's in iClone and the frames per second in export. Um, for now, unfortunately, we have that uh, restriction. But uh, yeah, um, I believe when, when, you, when you're rendering the video, this is the only way you have the uh, frames per second uh, adjustment for export. Oh, excuse me. E, it was somewhere here. Yeah, frame rate. There you go. Frame rate thirty, um, whatever. Um, but yeah, it's it's not, it's not a it's not a um, pure uh, twenty four frames per second uh, as I just mentioned. Um, but we we are working on getting that harmonized. I think for the next uh, the next version of iClone, so you can look forward to having that in the future. Um, so apologies, we don't have that yet, Ralph. We're still kind of always improving the software. 
Um, next question is for Tari. Uh, when you mentioned frames, is that 24 frames? For the, okay, so the next one is basically the same thing. So how long would uh, 500 frames take? Again, that depends on how many frames per second you export. Uh, Icon is set to the 60 frames per second, but uh, again, you can adjust that with the render settings, um, render video settings. Uh, and there may be some discrepancy, like I mentioned, um, but as long as you have the frame rate set, it's going to it's going to export at that frame rate, and it may be a little bit different um, when you export that frame rate. Just be aware. I'm not too familiar with uh, exporting at the various different frames per second. Um, the last time I did that was probably a couple of years ago, um, and there may may or may not have been improvements since then. But I I, I do know that we just actually talked about this um, last year, late last year, about uh, making this a uh, much more uh, detailed setting that we can adjust. <clears throat> okay, uh, next question is from Michael. Uh, when morphing a character to be larger, how can I prevent the hands from going into the body with animations? Um, really, there's no way to do that. Um, having your character's hands not go into the body. The only way to do to fix it is to adjust the hand position of the character. <coughs> um, so yeah, you want your your uh, if your character is getting bigger and morphing larger, you want to make sure your hands uh, move out of the way. That's the only way I can kind of tell you. Um, if you're talking about soft cloth, you can do like soft cloth physics, where the the soft cloth will kind of conform around the body shape or around the collision shape. But for, uh, for hands, we don't have that option right now, unfortunately. Uh, Nathan asks, will the render engine in iClone 8 have significant improvements? Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, one of the things we're focusing on right now in the next uh, year or so here is, is um, uh, render engine and render quality. Uh, and that's going to be um, gradually improving uh, as, the year, as the year goes on here. <clears throat> Um, but iClone 8, yeah, will definitely have a, a significant increase in the quality of the render engine. I can, uh, I can guarantee that. Um, what's the major difference, Ajit asks, what's the major difference between CC3 and CC3 for iClone? Um, so there's two different versions of CC3, for those of you who are not aware. CC3, of course, being Character Creator 3. Uh, Character Creator 3 for iClone, the free version, doesn't allow for FBX export. Um, but if you have a character creator three pipeline, then you can export your FBX characters. That's the, one of the main, um, obviously the biggest main feature uh, difference between the two. Uh, the second one is you can use uh, Insta LOD, so level of detail for your characters. Um, if you have the pipeline version, uh, so you can reduce the uh, poly count of your characters for various reasons. Um, the third advantage of, of CC3 pipeline is you can import DAS characters um, quickly and easily. Um, there's a, a specific tool in uh, Character Creator 3 which allows you to import DAS characters directly. Okay, um, Those are the three main advantages of CC3 pipeline. Uh, the, the free version of CC3 for iClone doesn't have all those. Um, okay, so uh, David asks a good question. Where do those light gizmos come from and what do they control? Um, so the light gizmos that I brought in um, I was in a rush that I just brought these lights in. I didn't really explain the gizmos. Oh, and there I messed my camera. <laughs> See, I didn't realize I was still in camera and I moved my camera. So now the process is go back to camera. Gosh, and it's all the way down here. Make sure we minimize our props there. Um, there we go. Um, transform. This is camera, right? Oh, we're, we're frame one. Okay, never mind. We're at frame one. Great. Okay. Let's add in a light. I'm going crazy here. Um, so those a lights can again can be found in the content manager um, under light tools right here. Um, you can just bring in this inlaid light, a different one, but it kind of has a different similar result. Okay, so this is a point light. And, uh, oh, this one doesn't have a gizmo. Should have a gizmo, right? Oh, right, the, um, the gizmo, there's a hotkey to bring that back up again. Oh, goodness sakes. Um, 
Da, da, da. Uh, right click it, I think, maybe. And uh, oh, control menu, script control menu. There you go. Okay. Yeah, so right click on the uh, light or whatever prop it is and go to right click and control menu. And then um, inlay light, this one right here. You can adjust the, uh, the value. Okay, basically it's just a little gizmo that allows you to easy adjust the, uh, the values easier. You can use this little lightning thing um, to make sure it's, uh, or to have like a sort of a different effect, okay? Um, you can change the color setting here. Uh, I'm sorry, this is, this, is light, this is light on or off. Um, right, yeah. Um, so let's see, we have this uh, inlaid light right here. Uh, let's go to our settings here. Um, let's move this down. There's this one here, which is broken. And this one here, which is fire. So you can create a fire light. So these are just like three presets. So let's change this one to broken, for example, and maybe have it uh, red. Okay, and play back. <coughs> it should <coughs> get me out of here. We know yeah, you so have the money, Lebowski. This, I mean, in, and you're going to effect, tell us okay? so when one way or the other. Enabled, I already sort of told you. Effect. I don't know where the it money is. Like kind of Just let me go. Okay. So, and you can also use the fire one. Ugh. <clears throat> you pay close attention. You can kind of see here. like fire. We like, know like, you have the money, Lebowski. Okay, this is useful for and the you're torch. going to tell us not for the one way light, or the other. That's what those are for. Uh, so for that answers your question there, uh, David. <clears throat> uh, Tari asks, when it comes to audio, is MP3 or WAV better? Um, <laughs> overall, your MP3 is going to be better because it's a smaller file. Um, obviously, if you get into much more professional, um, uh, you know, audio stuff, then you know, WAV uh, might be uh, might be better. Um, or there's other formats that are even uh, better than WAVE. Uh, but MP3 works for anything that I do. Um, you know, and obviously there's, there's different, uh, different levels of MP3 as well. You know, there's 128K, there's 320K, um, all that stuff. So, uh, you know, a, a, nice, um, a nice high bitrate for a uh, bitrate, bitrate? High bitrate for bitrate for uh, <laughs> for your MP3s. Forgot how to say that is uh, preferable because that'll give you good good enough quality. But again, um, there's there's other audio files that go into that are much much larger in size, and you use those for much more pro professional production value. Um, yeah, but MP3 is the way to go for for me, anyways. I don't really have uh, an audio engineer's ear, so it's all kind of sounds similar to me. Uh, next question is from Sean. Um, how do I keep Daz 3D render settings when using 3D Exchange to put a character into iClone? Um, so what you can do um, when you're importing Daz stuff into iClone um, is you can import the cameras uh, into into iClone using 3D Exchange, but uh, Generally, what I recommend doing is just setting up your cameras in iClone. Um, uh, there are, the, iClone has all the cameras that are needed for like all the industry standard cameras. So you can basically just copy and paste the parameters um, from your DAS camera to your iClone camera. But again, you can also import and export cameras with FBX format. The performance, however, um, it should be good. I, I've only done this with Maya. I haven't done it with DAS. But uh, yeah, you can import and export your cameras as well uh, from, from iClone. Um, but again, I haven't done it specifically with DAS, so I don't really want to comment too much on the, on the effectiveness of that. But uh, technically, you should be able to do that. <clears throat> okay, question from anonymous attendee. When I arrange the project, some of the mo movements happen and I don't want them. How do I delete the movements? So what you did is you probably did what I what I often do is uh, bring in the um, uh, or sorry move the prop at the wrong frame. So if it's like frame like six ninety five like we're at right now, and I move this wall, it's going to just you know start moving throughout the entire duration of the project. So if I take this wall and I just uh, you know move it over here, at frame whatever we're at, what's going to happen is oops, it's going to like move this wall from that frame to that frame. 
and that's not something that I want. Okay, so you can just control Z and undo that. And you want to make sure you do it from frame one, okay? Or else right click on the object and remove animation on that frame. Okay, uh, Nelson asks, is there any way we can make mini window full screen? The many of us use iClone on more than one monitor. If not, is there any plans for uh, making a mini viewport larger? Uh, the mini viewport can go pretty large. Um, where do we have it here? Oh, there we go. Um, as long as you don't, uh, um, and you, again, you can move this to another uh, uh, camera as well. Again, that's that's the largest it gets. You can move this to another screen, um, but there are people that use iClone on multiple screens. Uh, I know, I know for a fact we do have that possibility, that capability. Um, I haven't personally. I haven't done it on multiple screens. Um, but we do have the possibility to do that. Um, that's something maybe I would ask in the forums because I know we have a lot of users in the forums uh, that use multiple monitors. So I would recommend checking those out and uh, maybe writing a little uh, blurb in the forum. Uh, we have a very helpful community of people in the, in the forums that uh, you know have a lot, a lot of free time on their hands and just kind of hang out and, and chat. Um, so I'll throw you this uh, forum link here in the chat window. Um, there we go. <coughs> um, yeah, that's in the forums right there. Uh, a lot of questions can be answered there if I don't get to them right now um, as well. And it gives, it gives people a lot more time to kind of uh, um, demo a little bit as well, or kind of uh, troubleshoot before answering questions. <laughs> Uh, okay. Um, question from Ralph. How do you properly keyframe characters in iClone when it's set at 60 frames per second? Um, again, that, that frames per second thing, I'm kind of a little bit uh, sketchy on myself because I haven't done anything like that you know, in probably a, close to a couple of years. Um, so I, I sort of, uh, I'm not really up to date on the latest um, um, functioning functionality for that, uh, changing the frames per, per second. but. Again, I, I'll, I'll repeat, I did hear that we are going to allow for uh, different frames per second settings. We're gonna really um, focus on that in the next uh, next upgrade here in the near future. So you can look forward to having you know, uh, more frames per second, more, more flexibility when it comes to frames per second um, in the future there. Uh, okay, Daniel asks a question. When animating the transform property of an object, I can see it marks the keyframe when we change the position or rotation, but can I see each keyframe individually? Um, the keyframe of rotation, position, and scale. So um, position, rotation, and scale are all transform. Uh, okay, so they're, they're all, they'll all be categorized under transform. Now, um, so say for example, I have this uh, wall and I decide to, uh, you know, adjust the values of it. Uh, maybe at this frame, I, I change the transform position and I also rotate it. Um, it's, it's just gonna basically create a transform keyframe for either rotation or, uh, or scale, okay? So you can see it all adds in the same track. So unfortunately, there's no differentiation between scale, uh, transform, and, and rotation. They're all kind of restricted to this uh, transform track, okay? because they're just basically essentially just transforming the position, um, rotation, and the scale are right here. Okay, adds in the transform track as well. Um, not sure why, but they're all, they're, all, they're all categorized for sure under the transform track. Uh, so that clears that up for you, Daniel. <coughs> uh, Vol Vol Walter asks, uh, will there be a webinar about using a gun with its own movement and trigger, et cetera? Um, we can possibly do that. Um, there's a lot of uh, stuff that we can explore in terms of shooting a gun. Um, a lot of stuff that we already have um, templates for, for shooting guns, props, uh, smart props as well, eye props we call them, uh, that have preset gun um, uh, functionality. I believe the guns that are included in that police pack that I just uh, showed you have um, guns with uh, um, commands with um, <clears throat> action menus uh, in, in, those, in those guns. Um, but yeah, that's something you can probably put in the, in the feedback form that we'll email to you guys. And uh, uh, we'll try and possibly, if we have enough demand for a gun shooting webinar, we can do that in the future or 
if not at least a tutorial. Um, okay, so Steven asks, where can I get a handy list of some hotkey commands you use today? Is there a list? Uh, yep, hotkey commands can be found under help. Um, but, uh, but, 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 is there a shortcuts table link? I think it's this one. Yeah, help shortcuts table links. So these are your global shortcuts here. Um, and uh, let's see if we have that uh, snap to, I'm just looking for that camera one I was, I was talking about earlier because I know there's a camera manipulation. H, H is the hotkey, okay? So Combra, I, I was using, what was I using, O and Y or something? Oh, uh, so, so you can switch between the preview camera and the previous camera is H, okay? And U is to switch between the current camera and the previous object. So that's very useful again. So um, I'll, I'll show you why that's useful. Um, U is the hotkey I was talking about. If I have this uh, camera uh, selected, for example, and I'm modifying, uh, you know, because your camera will, will automatically rotate around whatever object you have selected, right? Where am I here? What am I doing? Gosh. Okay, let's just click on this dude and focus on him. Oh, wrong angle here. Okay, so say, you know, I, I want to rotate my camera around this dude, and then I'm like, oh, crap, you know, I have to adjust the depth of field settings. But over here in my... Uh, over here in my modify tab, basically all the all the parameters are just for Kevin. You can see Kevin right here and all that stuff. Um, if I press the U hotkey, it'll go to my camera and I can just press U and toggle between Kevin's parameters and my camera parameters. And I can easily go over here to pick target and pick Kevin for the depth of field. And then go back to Kevin and rotate around him like this, okay? The U hotkey is very useful. Um, I thought it was Y for some reason. Um, yeah, uh, that's why it's useful. Um, so really good one to learn. And that kind of shows you exactly where all the hotkeys are as well. So again, if you didn't catch that, they are under help, shortcuts, table link, okay? Uh, so Tari asks, what was the order of the workflow again? Props, characters, animations, cameras, and lighting? Um, yeah, props definitely first. You want to get your scene set up first, bring your characters in second. Yeah, animations, cameras, lighting. That's essentially the way I do it. Um, sometimes materials can also be after lighting or before lighting or at the same time as lighting because materials, again, the materials don't really matter until, until your final production. Um, there's something called previs where, uh, you know, it's a preview of a movie scene um, and it doesn't have materials or it has very, very basic materials, which they refine and add special effects again in post-production. But uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's my workflow. Uh, okay, Walter asks a webinar about uh, using a helicopter. Um, yeah, I could possibly do that as well. Uh, again, I'll just uh, reiterate any, any, any topics you want to learn about, put those in the feedback form and we'll get to those um, as, as soon as we can, either, either in tutorial or uh, webinar format. Uh, Stephanie asks, I like the simplicity of iClone, but can I create custom scenes and import them? Yeah, you definitely can. Again, uh, you can export those using uh, FBX format, OBJ format. Um, again, you have to have 3D exchange in order to do that for your scenes. Okay. <clears throat> uh, okay, Jason asks, uh, I was using my workstation via LogMeIn and, and agreed to update from Reillusion Hub. Uh, now the iClone 7 shortcut is broken. Uh, yeah, customer support should be able to be uh, help you with that, uh, uh, Jason. It sounds like kind of a pickle you're in. That's kind of annoying. But uh, yeah, customer support should be able to walk you through that. Um, I, I certainly can't do that. I've never used that myself. So, um, But yeah, they are, they're, they're the tech guys. They know all that stuff. So uh, login stuff, they're the, they're the IT of, of uh, Real Illusion. So yeah, give them a shout. Uh, and again, I put that in the chat window, the link for customer support. Um, George Greaves mentions here, if I recall correctly, you only bake the base color. Does it help with, with the rendering of all the others? Yeah, so basically I did, I did bake all of them, uh, George. I baked, the, I baked the bump, AO metallic, and all those others as well, because uh, you don't want to modify one without modifying the other in most cases, like in 99% of cases, 
uh, you don't want to modify the bump map and leave the diffuse map the same because uh, it just has weird results. So um, yeah, I did bake all of those. Um, and I do recommend baking them all at the same time. Uh, okay, Tari asks, uh, um, yeah, okay, just some comments, I guess. Yeah, it's not really, um, you know, I went through things a lot pretty pretty fast in this webinar. And again, apologies for that. But, uh, you know, this, it was a lot to get through. And uh, um, thanks thanks for sticking, sticking with me here and, and asking the questions in case you didn't catch anything. Um, okay, um, question from Nathan as follows. Uh, I'm not sure what that means if you wanted to. Maybe it's from the previous question, which I kind of forget. Uh, <laughs> uh, so maybe Nathan, you can kind of, um, if you want that question as follows to be answered, I kind of forgot what the previous question was there. Um, but let's move on for now. Um, question from Rosemary about, uh, how do I make sure a character's feet are correctly placed on the floor so they don't disappear under the floor or float above it? A uh, very good question and a uh, very common question. Um, if your character is uh, um, standing, let's take this character for example, and we can move him. Uh, wait, make sure the character is selected there. Uh, we take his hips and we just kind of move his hips down, just like that. If we don't have the feet locked, in case we could unlock them, our character is going to move right through the floor. Whoops. Okay. So, what we want to do is we want to go to over here to our attributes. We want to select foot contact. Okay. Then if we move our character, his feet will now touch the floor and utilize human IK to make natural foot contact. And we have the same thing with uh, hand contact as well, okay? Foot contact, very important. Um, and your objects, your floor, by the way, uh, if we select our uh, floor here, you can see it's right here. Where is it? There we go. And this floor is, because it has the properties of a floor, um, I believe you have to, uh, do, 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 do. no, okay, it's a prop. Normally you, have, you, you can convert to terrain as well, okay? Um, and uh, generally if you convert to terrain, it has that effect, but I guess it has it on some props too. Um, okay, let's go to the next one. That's the foot contact anywhere there, Rosemary. Hopefully that helps. Um, anonymous attendee, I have a problem with Motion Live with iPhones closing the program, restarting it, and restarting the same problem. Um, that's something for customer support, um, unfortunately there. I can't really go into the uh, iPhone and start troubleshooting live on the webinar here. So uh, that's a question that I recommend uh, you contact customer support about there. Um, <coughs> Gary asks, if I put a video on the wall, do I still bake it before or after placing the video? Uh, no, just place the video on the wall um, and play back if you want, uh, however you want. Uh, it's, you know, it's quite restrictive putting a video on a wall. There's not much customization you can do, but again, it, it does what you need it to do in certain cases. Um, and I can do a whole webinar on putting videos on walls and stuff, but uh, yeah, don't have much, too much time left here. Uh, Gary asks, what's the recommended length of a scene in frames? Um, so I get this question asked pretty often, especially um, from people who are newer to, to, to animation in general and to, and to uh, you know, story creation in general. How, like, how long can I make my project or how long can I make this? Or, um, and generally what I recommend people do is keep your project lengths really short. Just, just save like, it's better to have a hundred projects that are like 10 seconds each rather than one project that's uh, like a hundred seconds, you know, or a thousand seconds, you know, cause it's, uh, you want to keep your projects um, minimal and lower resource as, as low resource as possible. And if you have a project that's like a, you know, 200 seconds or something, that's going to really lag your computer. It's going to have to process a lot of stuff in your scene. So I recommend keeping your projects very small, very nimble, and you can always, you know, piece together your, your renders later on in video editing software. Um, so there's no real, real um, number I can give you, but keep them short and simple. Like this one right here, this, this scene that I just animated, that's probably my entire project. Maybe I would have a couple more 
back and forth for the dialogue, but that would just be it. And then I would connect it with another project. Um, so Nathan asks, how do you increase and decrease the lights on the timeline to simulate a flicker? Uh, so basically what you would do is you just go to, um, I showed you how to set the intensity of the light uh, before. So let's take a look at this, uh, where's our spotlight here? So spotlights, um, back to frame one. You go up here and you go to multiplier. So let's just change our preview camera and uh, find our character with a spotlight. So we'll change the spotlight to like zero. And then here, maybe a couple frames later, we'll change it to like five. Here, change it to like zero. And then here, it's like, like maybe five. And then if we play back, okay, it's just basically, you can click and drag and copy all those keyframes, control C and control V here, you know, control V here, whatever. And uh, you can see the spotlight's kind of falling uh, off his forehead. Get me out of here. <laughs> That's how you create a flickering spotlight. Just change the multiplier value. Any, any parameter you see in icon that's green, you can keyframe it. So you can change the value at different frames. Okay, very important to note. If you see a value that is green, that means you can adjust that value at various points on the timeline. Okay, so Kim mentions here, elaborates, uh, Intel RealSense is their version of the iPhone 10 camera. Um, so probably not at this point, but I know that we are working on trying to get uh, Android with the new Android phones. Um, uh, we're gonna have the same thing available for new Android phones, as well as iPhone phones, iPhone phones in the near future. So Android users rejoice. We're gonna have that coming up. Um, not sure when, but uh, this year, all right? Uh, so Stephanie asks, can you still use Connect for mocap and iPhone 7? Yep, totally. You can still use Connect. Uh, we don't support it anymore. We don't update it, but you can still use the Connect for motion capture. Um, so Tim asks, can you do a full 3D exchange tutorial on all of its features? Yeah, it's a, it's a good idea. I mean, uh, there's a lot of pipeline stuff going on, so we could uh, do a 3D exchange tutorial. Um, put that in the feedback form, and uh, we'll, we'll try and get to that in the future. Although. 3D exchange is, is changing in, in the near future here. It's going to be uh, a part of part of iClone um, uh, as a plugin. Um, so Plan Original asks, how should I import just a head mesh and not the full body? I tried importing as a non-human, but it didn't let me scale. Um, so importing a head mesh, that would be done through 3D exchange. And what you would do is you would export visible. So if I take my character here, and I edit this guy in 3D Exchange. And he'll load up. What I would do is I would just make all the other meshes invisible and just only export the visible uh, mesh, which, is, which would be the head. So I'll get to that in just a sec. Uh, so Walter asked, So what we would do is we would uh, take our character. Uh, I wish I could expand this a little bit. Um, body. Uh, and get rid of all this stuff. Whoops. Uh, we don't need this, this, this. Get rid of all this stuff that we don't need. Uh, no, and we would have to, you know, choose the particular ones in here. Let's just ignore that for now. And what we do is we go file export FBX, <coughs> excuse me, include geometry. Uh, there should be an option for visible only. <coughs> excuse me. Um, yeah, remove hidden mesh. Yeah, so remove hidden mesh and basically all the mesh that you've hidden here. Uh, will be removed, okay? So you can just get rid of these two and select remove hidden mesh and that should do it. Um, yeah, but you wanna in, in, ensure you uh, select this and I believe remove hidden mesh to get rid of all the other mesh that you don't need. Um, there should be an option here. 
But, uh, for the characters, I think it's different. For the characters, I think you use this one here. For the props, you use uh, hidden mesh or visible only up here. Okay. Um, Josh mentions here, it does not respond to point lights or spotlights. Um, you can elaborate that if I haven't answered that already there, Josh. Um, uh, how would you get a darker scene like, like that with Toon Shader since you're not using directional lights? Oh, so uh, you want to like, have a dark and dangerous looking scene with Toon Shader? Uh, you know, in its essence, Toon Shader isn't supposed to be used for that kind of lighting. But I mean, if you wanted to, you would be, yeah, of course, be restricted with directional lights um, because the spotlights are not uh, not available in, in Toon Shader um, there, Josh. You'd have to, and I, I, I don't use Toon Shader a lot. I haven't probably used that in like a year or two as well. But uh, yeah, um, you would be a little bit restricted in, in, in the lighting with uh, with Toon Shader, um, focusing on directional lights there. But you, you can do the same thing with directional lights as well. You just have to uh, change the values. Um, and you can use uh, various, you know, cones to focus the light of a directional light on something. Uh, I can, there's a whole other tutorial I could go in on that as well. You kind of have to be a little bit resourceful is all I'm kind of getting at, getting at there. Okay, so uh, plan original, uh, you mentioned a camera list on the timeline to change from one camera to another. Uh, was it under the motion tab? Yeah, I, th I think I talked about that with the, uh, the keyframe, or not the keyframe, the hotkey that I talked about earlier, the U hotkey and the H hotkey. Okay, toggle between cameras and toggle between camera and props. Uh, Rosemary asks, can we mute dialogue or background music? Yes, you can. Um, that just basically involves going into your, uh, your um, project tab or project uh, track. And anything in uh, the project track here, you can find your sound and uh, um, effects and everything like that. Uh, so sound, you would basically just do the thing right here, delete whatever clip you have in here. Uh, and the same goes for everything else as well. Okay, so each individual uh, um, prop and character also has their own soundtrack. So you just do the same for that. Okay. Um, and if the clip is there, you just right click on the clip and uh, select the stuff that you need to do. Um, Okay, uh, question from Marion. What pack did you use to get your characters to talk? Uh, it wasn't a pack that I used. It was just uh, that, that feature is embedded in iClone. Uh, it comes default with iClone. So you don't have to have a pack to get your characters to talk. Um, I just used automatic lip sync, which is really simple and easy to do. Um, hopefully that answers your question there, uh, Marion. Um, so Roger mentions I'm pre I'm doing previews on a project at the moment. I have look I've been looking at very specific props uh, from the early 1900s. Where do you recommend I look for these uh, specific props? I have had no luck. Uh, Roger, if you have looked in the content store, you can also look in the marketplace as well. Uh, I'll put a link for the marketplace. Um, the marketplace is a little bit different from the content store and the way it's different, I get asked this all the time, is that uh, the marketplace is basically unfiltered. Um, so we, do, we don't certify the content in the marketplace. The marketplace, you can basically just publish whatever you want. Um, so if you have some content you think is cool, you can publish it in the marketplace. And if we think it's good enough, if we test the quality and we think we've, we've approved the quality, it becomes certified by us and then goes into the content store. But there's a lot of stuff in the marketplace. Sometimes we don't have the time to get to it. Um, there's a lot of good content in the marketplace as well that you can search for that particular stuff. I put that in the chat window, the link for that. Um, so uh, Victor asks, where do you buy the light tools PBR? Um, so let's find the link for that here. <coughs> Substance. Maybe just Google it, probably it comes up. Yeah, there you go. Here's a Substance 200 pack I used. I'll throw this in the chat window for you guys. Whoops. There we go. Okay. Um, that's where the uh, Substance PBR uh, pack is. Um, you can go like 
iClone Light tools. Uh, Light Studio, I think this is another pack that you might have been looking at. Light Studio, this is just some light, light settings. Um, this is a pretty good pack actually as well. Um, if you want some like, you know, template light settings, uh, this is a really good pack to check out. Whoops. Oh, what am I doing here? There we go. I sent it to the wrong people. This one. There we go. Okie dokes. Uh, let's go to the next question. We have a, we're in the home stretch here. We have a few more questions, I guess. We've gone like an hour and a half over time almost. Uh, okay, Sean asks, my render in Daz, it shows all the details on the costume, like the leather and the metal. Okay, so um, Sean, uh, what I would recommend you do uh, is not, if you're importing your Daz characters with the, with the materials and all that stuff, I wouldn't recommend going through 3D Exchange um, because um, Character Creator 3 has a specific, uh, uh, Character Creator 3 pipeline rather, has a specific tool just for importing Daz characters. Um, so if I go to my, uh, let's load up uh, CC3 here really quick. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't recommend, anyone who uses Daz, uh, who import, wants to import their characters into iClone, the best way to do that is directly in Character Creator 3 pipeline, okay? Do not do it through 3D Exchange. If you use a 3D exchange process, it's still possible, but again, you have to spend a lot of time uh, transporting over the materials, the textures, and assigning them to different parts, different meshes, and uh, yeah, we used to have to do that a couple of years ago, and it was super annoying. <laughs> um, but yeah, now we have the, uh, um, the, the tool in Character Creator 3 that allows you, again, this is a pipeline version, Okay, so this tool is not available with the free version of, of uh, Character Creator 3. <coughs> Excuse me. And I'll show that to you in just a sec, because it's very important for DAZ users. Um, okay, Ahmed asks uh, how to, I'll just answer a couple of questions while we're loading up here. Ahmed asks, how do you create custom care and clothing? Uh, there's various programs to do that. One, uh, the best program for creating clothing is Marvelous Designer. Um, Recommend checking that out. Um, a lot of our a lot of our developers use that. Um, you can just Google it. Gosh, come on. Marvelous designer. Well, this one right here. This is a really good tool for uh, creating um, clothing on characters, and you can export your uh, your um, your iClone characters into Marvelous Designer and create clothing specifically for them uh, as well. I'll throw this in the chat window for you guys. Oops. Okay. Close down the uh, three exchange. We need this. Uh, close this thing. I believe Character Creator 3 is still loading up. Yeah, so Nascent's mocap, we don't have a, a support for that right now. Another person had asked that. Um, is there an issue, Ryan asks, is there an issue with spring animations when importing to Unity? Um, I have cartoon designer character with a long ponytail that bounces an icon, but not in the Unity import. Um, I believe that spring stuff, when you import it into uh, to Unity, you have to do that uh, using a Lambic uh, format. Okay, so Lambic is something that, a file format that um, takes, that allows you to export um, physics and, and spring stuff. Um, you can't do it the traditional way with FBX, or else you can manually do it in uh, in, in Unity as well. Um, you can uh, adjust the spring bones in Unity, but uh, unfortunately, there's no direct uh, import over. Um, <clears throat> okay, so uh, Transformer Tool is a tool from, from Daz. So if you go up here to Transformer, you just select your Daz character. Um, I believe this is a character that I'd previously saved from a previous webinar. And uh, basically, yeah, this transformer tool will allow you to import the Daz character with a single click. It'll, it'll set all the, all the materials correct. Uh, we spent a lot of time creating this plugin for Character Creator 3. Um, yeah, okay, so this is uh, it's not a character that I've uh, used in the past. It's something that uh, 
is outdated now, but basically any Daz uh, Victoria character, Michael character, um, G8, G1, G2, <coughs> excuse me, uh, imports in like, like a breeze. Uh, and that's, uh, I believe there's probably some information on that. Like um, Daz, whoops, character creator as transformer. There's definitely going to be uh, more um, information on that right here because I don't want to spend a lot of time um, going into detail right now. I'll throw this in the chat window. Okay. Uh, so Jeff asks, is the discount still available for content purchases? Yeah, the, basically as long as you um, uh, fill out the survey for the content store or fill out the survey for the webinar, we'll send you that 10% uh, content store coupon there. Um, okay, so Ryan actually has a forum post here on uh, Unity Spring into, uh, or sorry, uh, Spring Animation into Unity. Um, ba -da -ba 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 -ba. Um, unfortunately, I can't copy and paste this uh, this forum quote or this forum thing, but uh, yeah, that's the place to ask because I've never done that myself, not for a long time. But uh, um, unfortunately, I can't copy and paste from the uh, Q and A window. It seems so. Um, yeah. So uh, live face question from another question from Ahmed. We we will support uh, Android devices in the future. That's just a matter of time. Uh, so the video will be sent for you to download after a couple of days, an anonymous attendee asks. So you can review this video on your own time. Again, we're recording it for posterity and we're going to send it to you right after this webinar here. Um, so Josh mentioned you should consider a marvelous designer to CC3 tutorial. Oh gosh, I don't think we have, we may have one of those. Um, I know we definitely have the ZBrush ones. Uh, let's take a look. They would be under the uh, tutorials here, or maybe in the developer center, but uh, yeah, maybe not here. There may be some white papers. There should be some white papers in the developer center, though, um, for uh, character creator here. Resource files, cloth design. So this one, this one, this cloth design one probably is using uh, Marvelous Designer. Um, it'll it'll be somewhere here. Lightwave Blender Maya. Here you go, Marvelous Designer down here. So cloth design, um, right here. So Josh, you may be interested in checking this out. I'll throw this link in the chat window as well. Oops. So this is a, for those of you who want to develop your own content, your own clothing, your own characters, this, uh, this link that I just sent is quintessential for you guys. This provides all the resources, regardless of what software you use. There's white paper, there's tutorials, um, everything is on here. Um, so highly recommend checking this, uh, this page out. And uh, yeah, that's about it. Okay, guys, I think we're gonna, we're gonna uh, cut off the webinar here now since we've answered all like 78 questions for today. Um, and, uh, again, we are recording this. So uh, if I, if I skipped over something too fast, we'll send the video link for you guys to review on your own time. Um, so I just want to thank so much. Thank, thank everyone so much for attending. Um, sorry, I can, again, I kind of rushed through the, uh, the, uh, demo part, but, uh, yeah, hopefully you learned a lot and hopefully, uh, you know, I can, uh, you can go to improve your, your iClone, uh, workflow in the near future here. Uh, since we have a lot of free time with most of us under quarantine, we can probably just uh, sit around and, and uh, mess around with iClone and get better at it as we, as we move along. Um, so again, thanks so much, everyone. Um, I appreciate you attending this webinar and let us know your feedback um, uh, in, the, uh, in the survey we're going to send out to you guys. And uh, I encourage you guys all to uh, stay safe out there. Um, stay indoors if you can. And uh, um, yeah, I think that's about it. So we'll go ahead and end off the webinar and I'll say good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you guys are in the world. And we'll talk to you uh, in the next webinar or see you in the next tutorial video.